Good morning, everyone. Just give it a, a few minutes just to let everyone log in. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our second UK BIM Alliance virtual conference of this year. My name is Craig Hardingham and I am a member of the UK BIM Alliance community's leadership team. Thank you for joining us for this event. We have a packed agenda of speakers from across the infrastructure sector of our industry. So first up is our keynote speaker, Mark Enzer, from the Institution of Civil Engineers Data and Digital Community Advisory Board. Peter Vale will be giving us a case study on digital innovation at Tideway. We then have a panel discussion led by bim for water involving Anglian Water, Irish Water, Scottish Water and At One. Matthew Brett will be speaking about BIM and digital engineering at TFL. James Daniel then talks about digital tools in highways. Uh, and our final speaker is Dr. Jennifer Schooling presenting on smart infrastructure and construction. We will then finish the morning with a question and answer panel led by Mike Turpin of the community's leadership team. So before we start with the presentations, just a bit on GoToWebinar. You are all in listen-only mode. Uh, if you have a question, please ask this through the questions tab, as you can see here. As I said, Mike Turpin will be managing these questions and will run the Q&A session once everyone has presented. Please avoid the raise your hand option for the questions. And uh, this event is being recorded and we will make it available on the UK BIM Alliance YouTube channel just as soon as we can. So for our first session, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Mark Enzer from the IC Data and Digital Community Advisory Board. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I just need to share my screen and then we'll be off. Here we go. So I'm kind of hoping that you can see that now. Do you want to just confirm it? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So so I think we I think we're off. So yeah, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to to speak. And and today I am wearing an ICE hat, which um, as some of you might know is is not my normal hat, um, but it's a it's a privilege to wear this one. Um, and what I'd like to do. Uh, is just introduce uh, what the Institution of Civil Engineers is doing in this space um, of data and digital um, and kind of hopefully invite your involvement in it because I think it's uh, it's really exciting. <clears throat> and, the, and the way I'll do this is um, by, by kind of starting at the top, talking around what the ICE is doing in general uh, around knowledge and knowledge sharing um, across the kind of the whole gamut of what the ICE does, uh, but then focus in specifically to what we're doing in uh, in data and digital. So let's start at, at the top there, and I'm just going to move my slide on. There we go. So I'm imagining that the Institution of Civil Engineers is going to be pretty familiar to people around here. So I, I won't give a kind of a, a full history of it, um, but what we are essentially um, is a professional membership body um, and it's a, a body that gets listened to. Uh, it's really influential in government and industry 
uh, and it provides support to its 95,000 members. I mean, that, that's that's an awful lot of civil engineers out out there. Uh, so, like I say, the the ICE is uh, is is really influential in this space. Uh, the role really um, is to promote the profession uh, as it has been doing for 200 years, um, and this is in the belief that civil engineers play a really important role in in everyday lives uh, and so the ICE works really hard to support them uh, and a key way of doing this um, is by helping the industry to learn and to share knowledge um, uh, so that we can um, maintain and enhance the built environment um, and also promote the essential contribution that civil engineers to, uh, make to society worldwide. So not, not just in the, in the UK, but, but much broader. Um, and that activity is guided through our insights and knowledge programs. Uh, so this is right at the heart, right at the core of what the ICE does. Um, and uh, we work with our members uh, and with industry professionals to support the development of this knowledge uh, and then the sharing of it. So, um, a, you know, a huge role for the ICE. And I think that um, <clears throat> what we've got to share around data and digital absolutely fits into this perfectly. Uh, so in doing this, um, the ICE provides um, key insights for a, a broad set of stakeholders. Um, and so what, what this is kind of doing uh, is providing some kind of um, influence uh, broader than just the membership. Uh, and so, uh, as I think many people will be aware, uh, the ICE plays a, a key role in, uh, in influencing and helping to, to, to guide policy uh, across a wide range of subjects uh, from decarbonisation and resilience uh, through what's happening around improving productivity, uh, the whole stuff uh, to do with uh, clean energy uh, and um, the kind of the nexus with uh, with water and sanitation, but but uh, also at the heart of this, um, the data and digital, which as we'll see later, <clears throat> we see as a key enabler um, of, of the rest. So there's these this insight for a broader group of stakeholders but then also the specific knowledge for our members. Uh, and, and this is kind of at the heart of what the ICE does, uh, because we need to help to, to meet the continuing professional development needs um, of all our members at all stages in their careers. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of spread quite broad across um, uh, many members and many stages in career. Um, we have to respond to what is um, most relevant in the industry uh, and identify and fill skills gaps uh, and um, potentially literacy gaps here too. So, for example, on, on digital literacy, um, helping to, to, to fill in those. Um, the programme overall gets develop, de developed and delivered digitally. Um, via prestige lectures and tech talks with all sorts of supporting material. Um, but then we also have um, other approaches which specifically target industry leadership uh, and, and uh, kind of take on that uh, development of knowledge uh, of the people who are at the top of the industry. So hopefully what I've shown here is um, a, a kind of a focus both on our members but also on the wider stakeholder community. And what this ends up being is a kind of a pyramid uh, of coordinated and structured, digitally driven and delivered um, event program. So, so it kind of goes all the way through from um, very high impact events, but a, a small number of those, uh, like the uh, State of the Nation and major report launches, uh, down to uh, um, what you can see here, 80 to 120 events delivered locally, uh, where there's um, an awful lot of them, but maybe not such a, a broad impact, uh, and, and hence the um, hence the pyramid. But I think if you have a, a quick look through that, you see that this is an amazingly packed and ambitious program um, of sharing, um, well, developing and sharing knowledge. 
uh, and um, in the pursuit of, of what I was saying earlier on. The goal of all of this um, is really to, to mobilize the network uh, in support of the overall ICE plan. Uh, and so we'll build a body of relevant and reliable knowledge, um, which is created um, through, um, well, through hard work, but actually some serious in, uh, analysis uh, and insight and, and science. And, and this body of knowledge uh, will enhance the technical competence and understanding of, of our members, that broader stakeholder group. Uh, and it can provide kind of trusted, timely insight uh, to, to, to leaders. Um, we're also expecting and seeing um, a, a digital network for experts um, that allows this knowledge exchange to flourish. So it's not like, like it's just kind of delivered once and then that's it. Uh, this is something that can continue to be delivered uh, because of that, uh, that digital network. And the way that we'll do this <clears throat> is through the creation of these community advisory boards. And in a moment, I'm going to delve into one in, in particular, the digital, um, the data and digital one. Um, but there's lots of them. Uh, and this then supports the community of practice and the specialist knowledge societies uh, that will help to generate the content for the knowledge programs. Um, and the, the whole thing will be driven by task and finish project groups. So it doesn't kind of just drag on forever. It's really focused. It comes up with some really useful stuff and then that's shared. Uh, and really importantly, uh, we're going to work and collaborate with others uh, in order to do all of this. This is not just an internal thing by a small group of, of, uh, of people. This is very broad uh, and invites collaboration, which is, is part of the reason for, for sharing this now, because I'm sure many of you will end up being involved in that collaboration, and that will be a brilliant thing. So when it comes to these community advisory boards, which are kind of at the heart of, uh, of, of developing and then sharing the, the knowledge, um, there's an awful lot of them. Um, I've kind of covered the, kind of the broad spectrum of them uh, and I won't run through each of these in detail uh, but what I hope you can see from this slide uh, is that there is a really good broad spectrum uh, and they are addressing the real key issues of our day so the decarbonization the resilience the productivity uh, the data and digital as a as an enabler of that um, so so <clears throat> what I'm, I'm hoping comes across from this um, is the sense that the ICE um, has its finger on the pulse of what is most important just now uh, and where the, uh, the knowledge needs to be developed and, and shared. Um, so that's, that's the kind of the broad picture. Uh, but let's now dig into um, a specific board, the Community Advisory Board for Data and Digital. Uh, it's easier to call it a cab, um, and I might just uh, might just do that just to uh, to, to save my words here. Um, now this is building on an existing track record, which is pretty impressive. It's not as if the ICE has just suddenly discovered data and digital. Uh, we've been working on data and digital things for quite a while. Not least of which is the recent insights paper uh, on digital retrofit for infrastructure. Um, the work with Project 13, development of a number of reports in there, uh, including the industry readiness for digital transformation, uh, a really key, uh, key report that is targeted at um, an enterprise view of digital transformation. So, so this is looking at you know, ecosystems of partners and suppliers uh, working around um, key infrastructure clients. Uh, and then the State of the Nation report that came out a number of years ago on digital transformation. Uh, and I, I do rather need to pay tribute to Anne here, who was the chair of this. Uh, and I think this ended up being a really key report uh, that has helped to drive the direction of the, the industry in the last few years. Uh, it identified the importance of unlocking the productivity potential of digital transformation. That's still as, as true now as it was when the, the report was written, uh, but also encouraging this step change in organizational culture and leadership 
to unlock the value of data and digital uh, and then to future proof our, proof our infrastructure networks which no doubt uh, Jennifer will talk about uh, later on so, so that report I would still commend it to you don't don't think just because it's been out for a few years that, that it's gone out of date it's uh, it's absolutely on the money still so so this just kind of indicates that the ICE has already been working in this place it's not kind of new to it uh, but what what we are doing uh, is really pushing it forward now with the establishment of this this cab uh, and I, I guess it's important for us to know what it is we're talking about when when we say digital data and digital transformation uh, and so I'd just like to spend a, a few moments uh, talking through what what we see it being uh, and again this is going to really benefit from your input into it to take it on develop it uh, and make it make it work for us all uh, but we think that at the at the core of all of this uh, are, are people, that digital transformation really is all about enabling people. Um, and it's enabling people to use information better to make better decisions. And so you can kind of see information as that golden thread that does join up processes and that releases value at decision points. So enabling people to use information better to make better decisions, but also enabling people to improve processes. So this is not just kind of taking an old analog process uh, and kind of turning it into PDFs. Uh, this is uh, rethinking, reimagining how processes can be, be improved through digitalization. And so it's enabling people to improve process. It's also enabling people to apply technology more wisely. It's not seeing technology as the silver bullet where you, you, you know, there, there's one particular technology out there that if you buy it, then it's going to solve all the problems. But it's kind of recognizing that it's the integration of technology that unlocks value. Uh, and so it's kind of putting technology in some ways in its place, seeing it as super valuable, but, but in the pursuance of something greater. Um, it's having a purpose. Um, and enabling people to make these, these better decisions. So if we think that, that that is what digital transformation is, then where does it get applied to? It kind of gets applied to all organisations. Nobody escapes from this. Uh, so this would be the client organisations, the contractors, the consultants, um, but um, all the way through the, the supply chain um, and also um, providers of advice, um, investors, uh, insurers, basically all organisations need this digital transformation and it should apply to all delivery processes and it should apply to all our built environment systems and then I put in brackets there uh, and it should apply to all people too. I'm slightly nervous about this because it doesn't sound nice to say that people need to be digitally transformed um, but I think people are at the centre of this uh, and there is the need for um, upskilling there is the need to enable people. So that's what I think digital transformation is. Uh, and, and then it's kind of what's the context in which it applies? I think a key part of this context is to be recognising our built environment as a system of systems, uh, seeing how complex and interconnected our in economic infrastructure is uh, with our social infrastructure and, and with the interface with the natural environment. And you add all of that together and you get the built environment, which really is a, a system of systems. That, that's what it has become. Um, and uh, our digital transformation really needs to apply to all of this. And so that means when I was saying earlier on that it applies to all processes, it applies to all the processes all the way through the whole life cycle of the connected built environment. So definitely applying to, to use and operation and maintenance, as well as the more familiar planning, design, um, construction and commissioning. So all processes. Uh, and this then is in pursuance of these higher outcomes. Uh, ultimately, the um, SDGs, uh, but you can kind of see that uh, these outcomes need to be aligned all the way down to local outcomes. So when we're talking about digital transformation, it really is a big picture and really has got the potential to unlock an amazing amount of value. Uh, and so it's into that context that the data and digital uh, cab then speaks. So what we're looking to do um, is to produce trusted and authoritative insight into the major issues that, uh, that face the, the, the industry. Uh, drive this creation of engaging material, um, identify gaps uh, and then help to fill them. Um, and then um, to work um, on delivering the actual data and digital uh, part of it, but 
also to work very closely with the other cabs because um, as I kind of indicated before, data, sorry, data and digital really is an enabler of other things. And so it's seeing digital as an enabler. So when it comes to our identified priorities, that the areas of focus, um, it is um, that thing of seeing digital as a key enabler of something more important, uh, delivering these outcomes that we talked about. Um, it's also about addressing adoption. So this is the soft side of things because it's very easy for us to think that data and digital is all about technology and it's going to have that, that, the hard stuff. Um, but if it's not adopted, then it's useless. And so there's the whole soft side, the kind of the socio-technical change, um, the, the way that we address culture and behavior uh, to actually unlock the value by having people use this stuff. So there's, there's the whole soft side. Uh, and then the third area um, is to do with sharing those lessons through CPD activity, um, through um, identifying um, how, uh, where one lesson is learnt in one place, it can be shared broadly across the rest so that we all benefit. Uh, and, and that we see as being a, a key way um, of spreading the value of this. If everyone just learns their own lessons uh, and then keeps it to themselves, uh, then it's going to take a lot longer to make the progress. So those are the, the three areas of, of, uh, of priority. And the next steps really for our cap um, are to develop those priorities so that we can uh, get them very clearly articulated at the kind of the next level down. I've just given you the, the high, high level summary um, to do the research exercise and stakeholder analysis to see how we can get people involved um, and, and you know, who the key people are in the key areas to, uh, to, to really take this forwards. Um, then we've got to present the proposed program to the ICE for approval. And that's coming up pretty soon. So this is this is kind of on its way. This is all in progress. Um, and then the work begins and we seek the collaboration. Uh, and that's where you come in, um, because um, the UK BIM Alliance is super important in this field. Uh, and you've got uh, an enormous amount to contribute. You already are. Uh, but I think when it comes to this uh, broader picture and the ICE really rolling up its sleeves and getting involved, uh, the, the collaboration will unlock an immense amount of value. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, I hope that that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, I hope that it sets some context for driving forward this fantastic subject area that we have um, of data and digital in the built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for a really informative keynote presentation. Um, now I'd like to hand over to our second presenter, Peter Vale, who will talk be talking about digital innovation at Tideway. Brilliant. Hi, uh, hopefully you can see me. I'm just going to try and share my uh, screen. Uh... Brilliant. Has that appeared? Uh, we perfect. Perfect. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come along. Um, so you would have seen my bio. So I'm the engineering information manager at Tideway. And uh, I was asked to just think about what we could do from an infrastructure point of view and linking in with digital. And it, it's very close to what Mark's been talking about around digital transformation. So I, I'm going to go through our digital in, innovation approach and specifically look at a couple of innovations that we have been working on over the last year and a half, which ties very much into what Mark's talked about around digital transformation, the, the why, the benefits associated with doing it and also driving how do we actually achieve it through enabling staff and skills etc so I will carry on through and I'll just turn my camera off brilliant so for those that aren't aware Tideway itself um, is a big project an infrastructure project and we're currently uh, building the super sewer under the River Thames. Uh, and, and our challenge is to build that new sewer for London to prevent pollution. So the existing infrastructure is a combined rain and sewer system, which means that typically now uh, with the size of London and the development that when it rains, that excess sewage goes straight into the River Thames. So our vision is not just to clean up the Thames, but to promote a change in the relationship between London and the Londoners and their river. Uh, 
the project's been going since 2016 and as you can see I mean most of our major construction work uh, has already is coming to an end uh, in 2022 and we move on to testing and commissioning so we've been actively involved in this whole construction project phase and, and trying to adopt uh, you know BIM level 2 project to adopt digital practices to really realize the benefits that, that were discussed and thought about in the past and, and we're actually trying to realize that and then share that with the industry which is what this presentation is today. Um, we have a number of contractors that we work with uh, that covers the different parts of our uh, geographic areas but today we're going to be focusing on a couple of innovations that our uh, contractor uh, ECVB and specifically Costain approached us to um, uh, develop uh, a digital approach. So our innovation approach is very much, well, our program's called The Great Think, and uh, we, you know, our legacy commitment that we talked about earlier is to deliver a sustainable legacy of innovation and to capture and share via I3P. For those that don't know, um, Crossrail developed an innovation program called Innovate 18 around infrastructure clients. That moved into what is called I3P, which is a portal for the infrastructure sort of uh, arena to share share and collaborate on all things innovation and really that tied in with our vision of working to achieve the UK construction 2025 strategic vision. So I said I'm going to be talking about two particular uh, innovation activities and the first one is really around what we call the digital benefits toolkit. Uh, and this comes into understanding fundamentally what are the benefits that we could achieve from doing digital things, this I, digital transformation. But we need to be able to prove it to people to, to understand what those benefits are, how to calculate them. Uh, and then moving on uh, to digital leadership training, very much this idea that, you know, how do we achieve that? And, and Mark talked about the sort of maturity and readiness of organizations such that it's all well and good having digital and tools available but if you don't have people that understand or, or are willing to adopt these best practices um, we'll be stopped straight in our tracks. So it's interesting so the way it works is that we have that innovation program in this case with the digital benefits we we worked with uh, Costain to co-sponsor a PhD student to look at developing this uh, digital benefits toolkit which the case study we were going on and, and likewise the digital leadership training is uh, Costain came to us as a client saying look to support digital transformation and, and what we're seeing out of this benefit toolkit we really need to jump on board and we were quite lucky that CIT being a supply chain school which we'll talk about later had actually invested a lot of money to actually they, they saw that you know maturity of organizations the skills of the people doing it really needed to be lifted up to truly realize it so we we fully supported Costain and we wanted to be part of that development the pilot exercise to share what we're doing on our project to be able to share to others uh, and, and all of these will be publicly shared because following our legacy is it's not about compartmentalizing the information and holding it on it's what Mark talks about is that knowledge share that we can then share that information with the wider community so if we go through the digital benefits toolkit so well it's a toolkit. So our desired output was to develop a methodology for measuring digitization benefits, demonstrated using tools and specifically published case studies, which could then be uh, industry disseminated via the likes of I3P that we talked about, the Digital Twin Hub, the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which we'll talk about later. Now, the two tools that were created to identify and measure benefits, we called Dimensions and Tracker. And they were developed specifically to enable staff to identify and quantify potential innovation opportunities and benefits. And, and then by using a, a tracker uh, to, to measure and visualize the actual benefits realized by that innovation. Uh, and, and, and one of the case studies that, uh, that we'll, we've asked uh, Carolina to actually develop is actually of her process of going through the stages of creating this. So we could share that and, and, and provide that to others if they wanted to go through the same sort of journey. And of course, the case studies, um, we're currently finalizing them and we hope to be able to publish them uh, next month uh, via 
the, the various groups that we've got. So, so why do it? Well, the aims are obvious. Um, it, 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 a methodology to, to <laughs> identify the benefits, it's a cost and time efficient methodology to measure the digitization benefits, a robust and transparent methodology accessible with minimum training. That's That was key. We needed to have something that was simple, that would engage the staff, that could actually um, enable them to come up with potential ideas and opportunities around innovation. And then, and then subsequently a very simple tracking system to be able to prove that those potential benefits were realized. Um, we needed it to be flexible and sustainable to cater for the ever-changing digital innovations. You know, from year on year, from month on month, the technology and the applications uh, get better and are replaced with even newer, one more wonderful uh, blue sky solutions that can solve the, 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 the life universe and everything, etc. Whether or not it can, that's to be seen. But ultimately, it needs to be a methodology that integrates and influences the existing industry frameworks. So there's no point recreating something from scratch, reinventing the wheel. So the Digital Benefits Toolkit was the result of a review and add adaptation of existing industry frameworks. For example, within the BIM realm, there was the Price Waterhouse Coopers BIM Level 2 benefits. Uh, we looked at policy recommendations around Project 13, the Value Toolkit of the Construction Innovation Hub, academic research, and, and looking at things like the HM Treasury Guidance for qualitative assessments, including the Green and Aqua Books. So it's really taking what we already had and actually developing on top of that. Uh, and, and then sharing it with you, the wider community afterwards to, to use or improve or, or to say it's not good enough, you know, and, and, and scrap it. I mean, the idea is we have to be doing something to, 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 to help each other, etc. So getting the bigger picture. Well, the, the Digital Benefits Toolkit has been designed to, as we said, to visualize the outcomes of individual digital tools, but also to give the bigger picture. It's an understanding of the wider digitization program as larger than just the sum of its parts. It's too easy to, to, to silo what we do. So we need to avoid that compartmentalizing of digitization in that how, how it links together. Very much in with the National Digital Twin, the ecosystems, or as, as Mark talked about, the, it's a system of systems. And those systems of systems need to connect and work together. So for instance, the three tools, and, and they are part of our case studies, which was Aphex Planner, 4D BIM, and Flowformer. Have, have been found to have overlapping features. So an integrated evaluation within the toolkit recognizes the contribution of each tool at different periods of time to the benefits of reduced information retrieval time. And, and we were able to allocate a sort of percentage use across sites and periods. So the realization of, of the same benefits across the three different technologies I talked about testifies not to the redundancy of, of either, uh, but rather of the urgency and need of meeting it, as well as to the innovativeness of, of project teams continuously interrogating the tools used. So it shouldn't be that we should just look at one tool. We need to be looking at the system and the ecosystem and looking at how we can join those together. Now, what benefits? We talk about benefits, but I mean, benefits, there are typically three key benefits that we look at. We look at the financial, the, the typical traditional return of investment that looks at reduces and avoids the actual cost. So a hard cash saving. Uh, and, and they're quite certain you can, that you can measure them. They're very black and white. We then move on to things like efficiency. We're reducing the time required, doing more with the same fewer resources, you know, uh, and then focusing on whether or not that system with the integration and improvements or the information flow around how relevant, timely we make decisions. Again, relatively straightforward to measure. However, and that's where it stops, that there's also those very much intangible benefits that by doing something improves the quality of the outcomes that, that relate to a broader outcome around the digital culture and, and, and the digital maturity that by doing enables even more than if we just focused on, well, if we bought this product, uh, we know we can save money. Uh, so, so what we were trying to do in the sort of the dimensions tool that, that tried to identify the potential benefits was we were, we were asking them to think about what they thought 
the benefits would be within each of these areas. But ultimately, you know, as you can see, there's decreasing levels of certainty. And, and our journey is to start mapping and creating a framework that could potentially uh, address all three, and then the wider community could develop further. And then just to just to look at the, the sort of benefits that are covered, you have recurring, you know, the daily savings of printed costs, you know, they link in very much to what we call the financial benefits, you know, but there's also going to be those one-off uh, indirect benefits that came about by doing one thing which need to be measured that may not be repeatable, but we still need to classify it and, and, and record it as a true benefit. Because too often these benefits are just swept under the under the carpet and aren't truly realized and it's just business as usual. And then you've got even and uneven, the same target value expected to accrue year on year. Is this something that, that if we develop, we will be able to successfully get a return of investment or realize that benefit? for the for the same or even better year on year or or is this value just based on the percentage of implementation so if you if you don't commit to fully realizing something you're only going to get a smaller return of investment for instance and then we go on to things like passive and active you know uh, and then short medium long term and, and internal and external so the these these are all the factors that we were trying to build into the digital toolkit to, 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 and this was based on the sort of the information that came from the various other studies that existed. So the case studies that will be getting shared by um, CVB and Tideway cover a number of applications. And this was just because we needed to test the toolkit to see if it actually worked and would actually realize and improve these potential benefits. Uh, and we will just quickly focus on Flowformer very quickly. Uh, now, Flowformer is, is a tool that automates the process associated with paperwork and forms. So, you know, it's automating it. So no more lost and unreasonable, incomplete paperwork. Paper, I mean, I mean paper paperwork can get lost, can get, can get mis, misplaced. So it's all about automating and digitizing processes. Uh, looking at where there are holdups in the process itself and also reducing the time to process the information. Uh, and there was a whole host of forms that the contractors were using uh, and they were trying to investigate whether or not by using this tool they would realise these sorts of benefits. Here's some simple graphics that look at the sort of the cost to deliver uh, the product versus the benefits. And, and as you can see in the first year, it's very much, it's gonna cost upfront to implement with some realized benefits. And then what we've been doing is testing it through the toolkit to prove that there are some real benefits. Uh, and, and, and what we've extracted is that clearly the, the, the cost benefit ratio uh, you can see is the benefits that we estimated at 336,000 uh, over the three years against the cost of the software for 178. So you can clearly see that there are some real benefits that come from the, the hard costs, but we needed to break down into that to understand what they actually were. So it, it's quite obvious, minutes add up. You know, we talk about forms, but small, Daily processes generate most savings, similar to one example of timesheets, which they were able to identify that by going through this process, they could save £30,000 a year. And that was just one of the potential 15 forms. And we forget that. And it's all about chipping away the bits rather than trying to go for big, you know, and actually those small parts add up to huge potential benefit that people don't necessarily see because they are so small in their own right. Uh, and, and then looking at things like our digital plant maintenance system processes, looking to generate about 100,000 of cash releasing benefits and also 50,000 of efficiency gains. So again, 150,000 in, in a project <laughs> that is billions, it, it seems in, inconsequential, but they add up. And, and, and that's where it's clear that, you know, if we can get people to be aware of where we can focus these improvements, it will help the wider problem of, of, of getting comfortable and looking to develop more and more and more efficiencies across. And then likewise, a third of the flow former benefits were cash releasing. So we see that as a break even, even before taking into account any of the intangible benefits. But what insights were gained? Well, 
the opportunity gap it's clear the difference between the measured target versus planned benefits illustrates the missed opportunity for example with with Apex planner which was adopted in 2019 the late adoption opportunity gap was about £200,000, meaning that if we'd adopted it at the beginning of the project back in 2015 and taking into account the cost of the software, we could have realised £170,000 of benefits. You know, hindsight is a great thing, but again, this is starting to create the hard evidence to, to prove its worth. Translating benefits into to save man hours and, and man days, um, you know, we need to start the conversation around reinvestment. You know, where we identify save time around efficiencies, you know, we have to be really careful that we don't just take that money away. You know, the, the key thing is to not stifle the conversations by searching for immediate resource reduction. And, and what I mean by that is that in, in the case of Flowformer, the real benefits we we really worked out were was in the realms of about four days per year per person however it's the result of daily savings of minutes across high frequency low impact events and as such it might not necessarily be the type of efficiencies that can be reinvested rather this is where it starts going into the intangible area that it's more likely to manifest itself in a more stress-free work environment where daily operations are much smoother for all parties involved. So this is where we needed to quantify that some savings, although they, they could be taken out and reinvested, in some cases it's better to actually keep it for the purpose of those intangible benefits that come. And then we come into the, the normal financial V efficiency benefit breakdown. You know, financial benefits are clear, you know, one less invoice to be paid and efficiencies start to manifest themselves in time savings. But the digitization of forms with Flowforma saw a 35% of its quantified benefits as financial which is a cost value equivalent of the lifetime software cost. So in that case, it's with absolute certainty that we can identify that Flowforma adopting that, that product was a break even such that we were clearly able to identify real benefits and cost savings above and beyond the traditional hard cost. But what does this mean? As a tool, is it perfect? No, it's not. You know, is it open to, to be improved? Absolutely. You know, we need a greater focus on the data flow. What, what this has highlighted is quite clearly that where the data used in one activity, you know, it also ends up in another indirect activity with other completely indirectly involved people. Uh, you know, and this is where what, what good happens locally what we need to do is ensure that we identify what those wider system benefits are and then plug into them and develop them and not let them fall fall apart. You know, all that good work at the beginning, you know, then starts to be uh, torn apart because we didn't think of the bigger picture. Uh, we also need greater visibility of the information needs and dependencies running beyond that immediate activity and project. And, and that implies a greater understanding of how teams, beyond in our case, the engineers or the contractors, actually benefit from digital technologies. It's too easy to focus on those silos without understanding the, 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 the bigger benefits. We need to build a library of relevant academics. So the case studies that we produce, the likes of the Digital Twin Hub, and what Mark talks about as a knowledge hub through the CABs and the communities of practice is that we need to better pull that data from the various studies that are existing within the UK BIM Alliance and, and, and bring them together to understand those causes and consequences. Uh, and, and likewise, if measurement is so important to us, like what are the actual benefits, then we really need to have dedicated forums to deliver that. And I think that's what Mark has been looking at in digital and, and the CABs through the ICE. But that's just one facet of the industry that we could move forward. And, and, and just I'm conscious of time. The, the, the leadership training really was then to reinforce this idea of, of, you know, we can understand what these benefits are, but are we mature enough? Do we understand enough of digital not to be scared to adopt these innovation and new practices? So again, um, Costain came to us 
um, CITB, who are the Construction Industry Training Board, saw exactly as Mark's described as they need to improve the supply chain. They, they, they created some money investment to put towards some training around training uh, the leadership and management in, in all things digital. And we jumped on board because that aligns very closely with this whole digital transformation process. Uh, and it was clear that, that we supported uh, and wanted to be involved in developing training for our uh, supply chain and the wider industry supply chain. So construction industry is on the verge of a digital revolution. You know, managers and leaders need to develop the skills and technology knowledge to embed that digital approach that the framework has been starting to articulate and prove. Uh, and we worked with a number of people, including Koskain and Skanska uh, and various industry contractors to develop a training school uh, linked with the supply chain school to, to provide. And, and, and just to put into context, um, the supply chain school itself is actually a collaboration between clients, contractors and suppliers who want to build the skills of their supply chain. So it was clear that you know we wanted to work through them. And, the program that we've developed, and, and this is for you to go and investigate afterwards, really is looking at sort of virtual training, um, CPD around e-learning, around digital mindset of, of implementing training. It, it works off of what's called the Harvard School uh, uh, process. Uh, and there are two case studies, one that we developed at Tideway and one with Skanska. And it also provides you with a whole host of learning resources, at individual and corporate level around look, assessing your leadership skills, the maturity assessment and benchmarking of your organization to really truly achieve, develop, develop able to develop and deliver on, on that promised land uh, and personal learning. Uh, I know these PDFs will be shared, uh, so do go and have a look. And, and I think this is the way forward really to, to move things and to get that improvement that we truly want to realize. Thank you very much. One minute over, sorry. Thank you, Peter, for a, a great case study presentation there. Um, our third session, we have a, a panel discussion led by Claire Kovacs for, from BIM for Water. So if we just hand over to you, Claire, and yeah. just, just welcome our panelists. Hopefully you can see my screen. I can see your screen. Just welcome the rest of the panelists on onto the. Yeah, so guys, so we've got Jackie, Mark, Mick, Dermaid and Fiona, um, who are going to be on the panel discussion today. You guys want to share your video cameras? Okay, so um, this section is called the data perspective. Um, so data is such a wide term covering a whole range of the project asset delivery lifecycle and everyone has a very subjective view on what data means to them. And this is where we can often see miscommunications in data management, capture and analytics. So here we have a panel of individuals today who all work within the water authorities but in different program areas and sectors. So we thought it'd be really interesting to get uh, their point of view and look at their data perspective. So we've got a series of questions which I'm going to put forward to the panel um, and hopefully the guys will help support. So our question one, um, and I'm going to start with Fiona with this one, what does good quality data mean, um, oh, sorry, mean and how can it help improve productivity and functionality in your area? Okay. Um, well, I work for Anglin Water and I'm part of um, Asset Intelligence, which is quite a new team. We've been in place for just over two years and we're there to um, make um, data driven decisions easy and help Anglin Water as a whole make data, better data decisions. Um, we, can, we can make the decisions on a variable quality of data, but good quality data can help transform the way the business makes decisions about the way it operates, about the way it maintains and invests. And we're now working um, to, towards our first production of a digital twin. So as Mark mentioned in his presentation around digital transformation, 
um, we're hoping to bring together the data so having better quality data that's assured and reliable bringing people together to break down silos and sort of education and understanding what information and, and data is out there and obviously then trying to bring the technology together to try and make so that it's more slicker with trying to trans trying to um sort of move data around the systems but um my team uh, have recently been involved in a data quality assessment which is around carty and um they'd be, be that's sort of recognized as an industry standard of measuring quality of data and that's looking at um data where missing data uh, is um not available um, we're introducing rules and working with architects to try and change our hierarchies across both of our systems um, putting capture rules in place and um, having the confidence and where the data has come from so we have teams um, asset survey technicians that are going out and capturing data looking at how we can enrich our systems and then target sites around our missing data i'm going to push that question as well to mark from a site perspective Um, so yeah, from a site perspective, um, <clears throat> I think it helps if we look traditionally back at sort of three to four, maybe five years ago when we were looking at a multi-complex of a project. So a project which has got, you know, different uh, streams, chemical streams, interfaces that would traditionally would have been a two to three year project. project. I think now we're looking at uh, through using digital and digital twin capabilities we're reducing that time down to you know we can do projects of that sort of size within eight to ten months um and then moving on from that is obviously had this it's the younger generation coming up through as well and going back to what the other slides were about the citb that's a really good embedment of making sure that the younger generation are the ones that primarily could teach us as well some of the stuff that we need to know because they've already they've already got that within their capabilities so for us sometimes it's a bit harder to revert back to the digital side of things but for them it's good to obviously support us in the way that we support them so i think functionality is a good thing it's it's proven to be streamlined it's reducing time on site it's reducing health and safety eight man hours on site as well um, and I think that's just that's a massive benefit, not only to the industry, but to the environment as well in terms of digital. And then uh, Mick from like a procurement and uh, supply chain perspective. I don't know if you're on mute, Mick. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm still learning digital, as you can see. So, <laughs> so from, from my perspective, um, um, obviously head of procurement for the At One Alliance. So I actually am employed by Scanska um, within Anglian Water. So from a supply chain perspective, it, it's, it's all about the, the quality of um, data that is um, required to deliver a solution. And for me, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collaborative tool and everybody understanding there's one version of the truth. And, and that level of data is then able to be translated back into um, the previous um, person Mark's world in terms of understanding the needs of the on-site. So, but for me, for the SMEs, when I speak to the MS SMEs, it's the understanding of um, how the data is going to be re is required and presented through the duration of the project and that consistency across the business. Because if if I was a as, as a as a procurement lead, there's um, a, unless a business has gone 100% into the digital approach, doing hybrid versions of project deliveries does cause issues within the supply chain in that in terms of that consistency approach. So, so good, but in terms of good quality data, is uh, is it's about sharing an number one version of the truth. Great. Okay. So then our second question is, how could we ensure all stakeholders understand what data is required of them and provide it in the right format to avoid miscommunication? Dermot, can I come to you? Am I off mute? Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I work for uh, Irish Water and I'm not in the BIM, BIM world, but I'm in asset management practices, which are encompassing that, I guess. So to the question, um, I guess 
the work that, that we've been doing in, in Irish Water around the internal stakeholders pieces and you know what operations, uh, their data feeding into investment planning or into design phases of projects or uh, your delivery side into deliverability of projects and all these kind of supply chain issues. I think the biggest thing that uh, gets everybody on board is that context set out as to what part of the process they're feeding their data in and how it impacts decision making. You know, whether that's, you know, at a, at a, usually it's the operational uh, insights that give you a better design and really fine tune what asset is built in the end. So I think understanding the end-to-end -end process and the visibility of the key decision points and how the data and knowledge uh, that each team has a domain uh, expertise <coughs> on impacts on the process and the outcome in the end. Uh, in terms of avoiding miscommunication, part of that is, is definitely around having the right tools in place and the right competence to use the tools, um, what's required to get the best out of the tools. So it's almost getting people into that digital mindset that a uh, previous speaker spoke about. Okay, uh, and Jackie, from your commissioning perspective. Uh, good morning. Um, I work for ESD in Scotland uh, with Scottish Water and mostly with the commissioning team. As you can imagine, commissioning involves huge quantities of data, both receiving it and collecting it and collating it. And I think the thing that we need to remember in terms of how we ensure stakeholders understand what they have to do is the different levels that they come to inputting and accessing that data, the different levels they have of digital literacy. Uh, we deal with people on site who may only be with our organisation for two or three months. Um, they may not have really in, in, um, been involved with systems that we use or with any systems, in fact. Um, and, and right the way through to people who are so familiar um, with the digital world that they can pick up a system within a few minutes. So I think it's key that we understand that vastly different level of interaction and also the different level of interest. Um, it's important that if we have training, we make it available for people to go to later, um, not just one big training course, but that they also are able to um, access training as they go through because the men not actually have the day-to-day -day interest in the system that we think they ought to have. Um, in terms of communicating um, the formats correctly, I think that's all around the training. That's all around engaging those people with those different levels of experience and ability so that they understand what benefit they're providing in using the systems we want them to and accessing the systems that we want them to as well. Okay, thank you. Just conscious of time, so I'm just going to... Move on to that next one. So our third question is, how could data be shared and communicated to get better outcomes? And we're going to put this one to Fiona to start. OK, um, well, we need to understand what um, data is available to us because um, we're finding that we've got internal silos and um, and it's just getting across that their data is as important to them. You know, it's, it's as important to us as it is to them. But we've started to um, uh, work. So we've done some data quality roadshows where we started working with teams to understand what data they have stored in their silos and trying to sort of um, work with them to try and pull that data, understand what that data is and start to um, cleanse our systems. Um, we've also um, recently transitioned over to um, Office 365 which has allowed us as a team to um, start sharing information and then working with other teams to also share what information that they're holding. So it's um, it's been starting to sort of work really well. Okay, uh, back to you, Jackie. Yeah, my key thing here around is around the difference between security and secrecy. Um, in order to share data, the person you're sharing it with has to understand it's there. They have to know it's there. They have to understand how to access it. If we're sharing data by making people individually, project by project and document by document, giving them access, then we lose that ability for someone to say, there must be this document somewhere, there must be this information somewhere, and to go look for it and to find it for them for their own for themselves. And um, so we have to think we do have to understand the difference between security of data and secrecy of data. 
Um, the outcomes will improve as people have access to the information they need. That's pretty obvious. We've always had information. We've always had access, whether it was a paper drawing on a, on a site uh, or whether it was a phone call or a memo. Um, and so for me, the, uh, it's about the sharing, how it's shared and how it's communicated. We will get the better outcomes automatically. I'm going to put that question as well to Dermot. Uh, hi, yeah, I guess it's similar to the two previous answers. There's like a behavioural piece and then there's a technology piece. And the behavioural piece can be harder generally than the technology piece. And, and getting people to relinquish their, um, their private Excel sheets that have all of this wizardry in whatever part of the process that they own. Um, and, and getting people into a collaborative uh, space around data. But part of that is definitely having a, a technology or a platform that you know, addresses and pushes people to relinquish those, those uh, siloed held data sets. And I think that go, then that goes back into the system of systems piece where you can connect your cost data with your investment planning and your pro project portfolio data with your in-flight delivery stuff and all this complicated stuff that if there is a data architecture that uh, is considered across the broad reach of these different data sets that need to work together and people can kind of see that you know existing in a world where you own your own siloed data that's in a Excel or wherever cannot it just won't function for the business I think that technology uh, platform being set out and built out starts to address some of that behavioral stuff which you can you know really try and get people to address it but it's so hard it goes on for years around trying to unpick that silo mentality around data so that'd be great thank you it's a question for then so what does the future of data look like i'm going to go to mick with that one uh, for, for me, what does the future look like? It's with going from a supply chain perspective. Is is being able to have an open portal that we can just draw out their information into our systems, and it just goes back to that whole um, Project Thirteen principles in in terms of that collaborative approach to success. So so for me, you got you got to have that transparency of information and data, and 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 it's got to be on a shared platform. Um, so for, for me, that's that's where I think the future is. Instead of like a dumb and said, everybody having their own silo um, elements within the within the industry. If we start having a, a shared platform, um, I think that can drive a, a lot of successes for a number of projects in the future. Uh, Jackie, um, I, I, I looked at this um, question quite um, visually, I think, but that's what I, what I came up with was that the data would become more visual, more easily accessible. Um, I can imagine that there's going to be more devices um, available in the work environment. So more devices means more ways of demonstrating the information we've got. So not just written documents, but the fly throughs, the 3D models uh, and other methods of visual access to data. Uh, I can imagine that's going to become much more important. Great. Uh, Mark? Yeah, that's similar to what I was going to say. In terms of, I think it's, you know, the future of data is making sure that it's spread across the whole spectrum of a, of a project. So it needs, although we're, we're very good at doing digital and, you know, having everything in an office environment, just making sure that the people out on the ground have got that visibility of what we're trying to do as a success. So and, and give those people on the ground the opportunity to uh, give us their views as well. So use the technologies that we've got against the different platforms, but look at then uh, different pieces of kit that could be placed on uh, in order to get their information and their ideas across or back to the, to the office. So it's cross pollination is what I see the future of digital being, where it, it's simplistic, it's, uh, you know, it's a one, one piece product um and and with that i think there will come a success of uh, digital delivery and then our final question okay i'm going to put this one back to you mark on share a success where you've seen digital tools and data and where we've got it right on the site so yeah so obviously i you know as i'm a 
senior site manager within Anglia and I've got so I've just successfully delivered a project which was a um, it was a, a reservoir tank on a project in a small footprint which we were using an overseas uh, company uh, to deliver our concrete products and the success of that at one point when I, we were looking at the digital interface along with the actual construction face as well um, and we've done a digital twin photo so the photo was of exactly where the model was at that time in the 4D synchro within the program adjacent to the actual but um, the, the real world of the construction as well. We put the two together and that was absolutely mirrored, harmonized. So for me, that's a success in itself um, of just having that capability of using a digital platform. We also used ITP, so inspection test plan. So going back to it from a commissioning point of view, it was streamlined. We wasn't waiting for more data to be downloaded. It was straight off an iPad, straight into a, you know, into a central hub. Um, and we had the benefit of then doing a, a safe to operate as well, previous to even the, co the construction of the project. So then that gives the client more time then to go off and do other things. And, you know, we're, we're not pushing to the pencil end of the project at the end. Everyone's rushing around. We've got time to compose um, because of our digital platforms that we're using, and using them in the right, correct way. So they were good. Uh, Dermot, have you got a success story um I, I don't have any because i like i was saying it's like a confession um i don't have any bim because i don't work in directly in bim but i guess maybe speaking a little bit to the system of systems piece um the work i've been uh, leading in irish water for the last year and a half or so has been around what we call invest outcome and mm -hmm. how we go from risk assessment on the asset base to you know plan your interventions put in your investment plan and then drive them into your delivery and, and maybe into some of the BIM space from there on and in, in over to operations. And the success of, of that program is, so we're only halfway through it, it was to define how each of the teams interact in the whole thing end to end and also define the system and data requirements from it. And now we're about to kick off about a three year technology platform building that, which is about four or five IT systems and data architecture. So. The success well that that would be success if that was done and all everybody was happy but i guess the success was that we have a collaborative mindset from the last year and a half of, of the business looking to resolve its own problems and people like accountants talking to engineers more often than they did before or operations staff being way more involved in our planning of projects and design of them so we're hoping to build on that success in to probably be in more of the space around how it's impacted on using digital technology than that system of systems. Well, I can't you. quite um, it's a success yet. I'm, I'm probably jinxed the whole work ahead now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally to Fiona as well. Okay, so just, um, going back to our data quality assessment around CARTI, it's allowed us to be really open and honest about our data, whether it's been good or bad. And it's helped us um, develop dashboards that we've been able to share with other teams to start showing our progress on how we're sort of going to try and um, make the data better and more complete. But it's also allowed um, our, my team to become self-serving. So they've been able to pick up lots of skills and techniques and learn new systems, which has been really successful. And it's allowed them to sort of um, thrive and learn more and be the best that they can be. So that's been really good. Um, I guess, it, are there any Claire, questions from, go on. Claire, can I just add one thing, just if, yeah, if, sure. um, from, like, from a procurement perspective, going back to Mark's success, the company that is in question is, a, is an Irish company. They did a big scheme for us in the AMP, AMP 6 um, through Cambridge, and the obviously the management of that was a lot different, and the performance and the communication was really lacking because they was working off sheets of paper. and um, and so transferring into Mark's world and how we delivered Ludum, the, the, the benefits that this company sees from digital, they've now invested heavily in digital within their organization. So to me, that's a great success story because now supply chain are actually seeing the benefits of being sitting on one platform instead of all working individually. So that's a great success for me. So they can now relay that to other supply chain members within my party to say we need to be thinking more digitally because these are the benefits you can get out of that so i think that's a great success 
Good. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, I guess, is there any questions from the audience that they'd like to ask the panel? We have some time. Is there anything in the chat? I'm a bit shy today. Okay. Um, so, sorry, okay. Kate, one question yeah. has come through. Sorry. Um, yeah, go on. Days. It's more about bin for water though. So it's about bin for water. Have you encountered any problems sharing the Excel based data templates currently being utilized? Oh, I'm a, I missed a bit. I'm, I'm unsure of how to answer that question. I okay. would have to come back to you on that one myself. That's perfectly fine. That's perfectly yeah, fine. I'll speak to the, the, the group chair for that one and get them to respond to that one. Brilliant, thank you. Um, that was so the they, only had one more question if we've got time. Um, it'd be what would the benefits of open data be and the potential potential security challenges? Um, and I guess that's open to the panel if anyone wants to take that one. Uh, I just maybe one perspective, um, and I, I'm not so okay with the security challenges. But from the point of view of a water industry, one of the things that that uh, you know we're finding that Irish Water will obviously do its provide its treatment um, services, and then there's pollution prevention opportunities based on agricultural activities and how they're done. And it would it'd be quite a thing if you could complete a life cycle assessment of the whole water cycle. And if the data sets that inform that were available via open data or by collaborations or by the supply chain platform that Mike, you mentioned, and that you could assess pollution prevention options as well as just the cost of difference based on how that full life cycle of you know, water abstraction, the technologies and how they're built and the, whether it's the uh, supply chain data there and the operational data and that would be like the nerdiest thing to do but it would probably give us incredible insights into how we could really fine-tune the costs and the, the provision of services um and know what assets to build and so on but that's a that's my perspective maybe on where we could go with it it's a bit like digital cities or something but, uh, that's great thank you anybody else on the panel If not, then I think we'll call, move on to the next presenter. No, thank you guys for your time. And I hope the audience found benefit in, in listening to the guys with different perspectives. You can see that actually we've all got that want to achieve something and have that commonality of data. But we can see whether we often come into miscommunications when we don't have a really clear set out structure from the outset and provide that training support throughout um, through the life cycle. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Claire, and uh, and all our panelists, Fiona, Jackie, Mark, Mick, and Dermot. Uh, that was a really interesting panel discussion. Thank you. So, uh, whilst we're just switching over, uh, just to remind everyone to to post your questions in the questions panel um, as we're going through, and we'll we'll come on to the question answer session at the at the end. Uh, of the morning. So now to hand over to, to Matthew Brett to talk about BIM and digital engineering at TFL. Over to you, Matthew. It's all gone wrong. <laughs> right. Hello, everyone. So, yep, my name is Matthew Brett. I'm the TFL BIM manager. And today I'm a bit of an overview on, on some sort of BIM activities and digital engineering um, within TFL. I should just turn my camera off. Um, so today I'm going to give a bit of an overview um, around um, about TFL and, and a quick look at the digital engineering strategy that we've got in place, and then sort of deep sort of dive into some examples, just some examples of how we're using modeling and digital engineering tools uh, within TFL. So this uh, image provides a good overview of the many facets of TFL and also the challenges um, that, that presents in implementing BIM 
across the, the wide range of assets that it manages manages and maintains. Uh, these go from cable cars, highways, rail, underground systems and ferries. As a TFL bin manager, my role is sits within the central engineering area of the business um, within business and digital engineering team, which provides support across the whole of TFL. Being a pan TFL team gives us the opportunity to provide BIM support across many of the areas noted here, including projects in London, in London Underground, London Overground, DLR, and within surface areas, including things like Victoria Station, um, Coach House Project, Silvertown Tunnel, and Hammersmith Ferry. Within the business and digital team, we have developed a digital engineering strategy that is underpinned by the implementation of the BIM methodology uh, and requirements set out the, by the uh, ISO 19650 framework. So our mission in business di in digital is to enable the right data and tools to empower people to work more efficiently whilst maximizing safety and getting it right first time. So the digital engineering strategy uh, is set, sets out four themes, which are essentially underpinned by the implementation of BIM. First is data as an asset. Um, and in implementing common standards, methods, and information management processes will enable data to be better managed as an asset. There's digital toolbox, providing access and training for and exploiting digital tools to support engineering tasks to manipulate and visualize data enabling more progressive decision making processes the process and there's a digit digitization of the asset life cycle this provided the system supported by the cde and existing processes to reduce manual activities this will enable better access to data and better collaboration and finally the digital twin the end game here we are having the systems in place to manage our data and will enable us to create links to the physical assets via our Internet of Things and centers to capture and feed data to support better predict and prevent maintenance activities. So the following slides will give you a couple of examples where we're using the data and models to support engineering activities and stakeholder engagement. First, a look at Bank Station Upgrade Program project. This is a complex project, includes the creation of a new southbound running tunnel and platform for the Northern Line, a new station entrance to Cannon Street and a step-free access between Northern Line, DLR and the street. The bank project was produced following an, following an innovative contract engagement process. Tenders were paid to provide a competition proposal. At tender award, the best bits of the design were collated into a baseline. As part of the tender information, 3D surveys of the tunnel stations were provided for the competitive tender process. The bank project was an early adopter of BIM and 3D collaborative design. 3D models were developed for the tunnel platforms, cross passages and stations, and the digital models have been developed with the construction information and shared within TFL. This is an example where TFL are utilizing the 3D models and data that's procured on bank by the BIM requirements. In this case, we're using this data to support and engage with the operational aspect of our business. Requirements came from a TFL learning and development team working with the Northern Line operational manager, whose task was to deliver training to 400 train drivers on the new tunnel platform and cross passages. This training was to highlight safety critical elements of the new layout, including signage, platform layout, and new step-free access arrangements, such as ramps and new lifts. As part of the operational readiness, an animation has been created from the 3D models to provide awareness to the train drivers. This material was produced utilizing existing train video footage of the tunnel and incorporating it with the 3D model of the new tunnel and platforms using Bentley products, AKSIM, and Lumen RT. As you can see here in the top left, we are traveling down the existing tunnel just before the new station. This is then merged into the 3D model of the new tunnel. The 3D model has been embellished with the required safety critical signage. The train pauses here at the entry point sign before proceeding into the platform area. The camera positions of the animations were set up to, re to represent the driver's eye view. The bottom left is from within the cab, which is a 3D model of the Northern Line train. This has helped to visualize different positions within the cab. 
As part of the video, all safety critical signages such as new platform information boards have been added to the model so the drivers are aware of what to expect. The video illustrates each sign coming on and off as part of the awareness training. The video also moves around the new platform and across passages to help drivers familiarize themselves with a the new layout. The video also identifies the various step three enhancements such as ramps and new lifts and has been installed in their locations relating to the new platform. Finally, the train exits the platform again with the required critical signage added to the model, this time carriage markers and exit points. The model then merges back into the existing running tunnel video. The benefits of doing this are the operational manager has estimated that doing this training virtually would reduce the driver's training time by three days. This has a significant saving when training 400 members of staff. The virtual training also reduces the need to, for site visits and the training can be undertaken much earlier in the handover press process as it's desktop based. Here's another example where we have further exploited digital engineering tools and 3D models, this time supporting our carbon assessment process. A bit about the project for a bit of context. Circa's 27 million project to rebuild Collendale Station above the Northern Line tracks and island platform, providing step-free access, capacity enhancements, and enabling residential development on the current station and car park sites. Morgan Sindel, <coughs> supported by Atkins Four Ways, were contracted by TfL following an early co contractor engagement tender process following original concept design. The ECA process produced large cost carbon construction benefits that required a revision to the concept design. Morgan Sindel awarded the contract in September 2020 to revise the concept design and produce detailed design, which is comp um, completion due in summer 2021. The build contract will be let following the completion of detailed design of the new station operation by 2024. TfL are committed to reducing its carbon impact and have introduced requirements in how projects manage this. TfL must make drastic changes in its carbon emissions, including the delivery phase of projects and programs to meet the mayoral, national and international requirements. Research governmental publications, examples from industry and examples from within TfL have also shown that reduced, reducing whole life carbon reduces whole life cost demonstrating the benefits and a overt focus on carbon can have. A key tool to the carbon and energy, a key tool is the carbon and energy efficiency plan. This is the Transport for London pathway product designed to help projects reduce whole life carbon and cost. It aims to do this for providing guidance, promoting best practice, enabling cost effective carbon modeling and acting on conclusions to the infrastructure carbon review. The infrastructure carbon review is a governmental publication demonstrating the link between lower whole life carbon and whole life cost. TfL is a signatory and committed to delivering effective lower carbon, lower cost solutions. TfL are developing a carbon model modeling tool and are looking at ways that 3D models can be can support some of the data requirements within the tool. On this project, on this pilot project, we explored how we can extract key pieces of data from the objects in the 3D model to support the calculation of carbon. By using this approach, carbon information was automatically updated from the model on each data extract. On this pilot, this was done ad hoc. However, future projects will, the plan will be to align better with the project data drops. In order to use metadata from the 3D model as a basis for the embodied carbon data, we needed certain information that's coherent with the carbon factor. We also needed to know what material and objects were and the application of how much power they used. Everything else could be calculated using assumptions, rules of thumbs to get approximate figures. Wherever possible, TFL try to follow industry standard and best practice. In this case, we're using the ICE inventory for carbon and energy database. This is the database of material and submaterial and the defined embodied carbon content. These all have a unique ID that can be associated to cost breakdown and model data. TFL use this because it's the most comprehensive database. However, we also refer to the UK Treasury Green Book figures for appraisal. On the Collendale project, they have linked the IC carbon unique ID and the cost breakdown structure in the rail method of measurement. <clears throat> we don't need carbon data for every object or asset. Of the 1,493 level four elements, which is the most detailed level in the rail method of measurement, and from the life cycle stages in the BSEN 158 
zero four, we believe we only need 24% of the items, e.g. foundation, beams and roofs. To find out what we needed to model volumetrically and add the A13 material descriptions, we created a spreadsheet that could be searched and navigated through. The benefit of linking the RAL method of measurement is we can use this as a proxy for various other items key to carbon calculations, such as service life energy utilization, linked to the commercial estimates and linked to carbon estimates created in earlier stages of the project via the RAL method of measurement estimate and compared data across TFL projects. The RAL method of measurement breakdown has been reviewed by the carbon requirements identified that will be extracted from the CAD models. These are typically material volumes, weight, area, and appliance wattage. The RAL method of measurement unique IDs were also required to be included in the metadata of the CAD objects. This provided the structure and rationale lookups and how the assets can be related and simplified to support the carbon modeling and assessment. We've worked with our CAD support teams to review and configure the CAD data set to incorporate these carbon requirements. These metadata requirements have been rationalized and added to the model object library and shared with the project teams to populate during the development of the 3D models. Export tables were also created to extract the data. These were then referenced in the carbon model. On this pilot project, the data extract from CAD models carbon model and the IC database were visualized using Power BI dashboards. <clears throat> so what are the lessons learned? So we've learned that we need to ensure that the carbon related BIM requirements are in the contract as part of our information requirements and level information need. TFL need to host project wise environment to be able to take data grabs from the model. It wouldn't have worked where we don't host, although we could have asked for periodic submissions in the works information. As expected, there's little chance for BIM-driven carbon models replacing dedicated tools in the short or medium term if high levels of precision are required. What worked well? Using Power BI to aggregate and link the data, BIM extracts IC database and Greenbook energy figures for appraisal, as well as visualize the outputs. There's a minimum extra time required for the drafters to facilitate the Power BI carbon model, although they didn't add the uh, round method elements to the 3D model. The Power BI carbon model provided a ballpark figure for the region, if no to be lower, to that from a separate RSSB RAL carbon tool model. What worked less well, some items of the MEP assets are not modeled in the concept design uh, at all or to the extent required. Also some shapes, e.g. slabs and voids, were not modeled as they would be installed. There was no voids in the models. Uh, we didn't establish an effective way to track if carbon changes were due to design changes or design progression. A manual extract of the data is required. The Bentley products used in this product didn't have the functionality to make extraction at this time. Um, we are also looking at now taking these lessons uh, and implementing on another pilot project. So using digital tools and data enables TFL engineering to reduce the amount of site visits and work to a minimum. The ability to capture image, videos and scans to facilitate hosting and sharing of these digital consumables will encourage TFL and partners to reduce their need for physical site visits and going forward. This is an example where we have reused our asset data, in this case the point cloud survey data to undertake crossover clearance assessments for one of our major programs. This task was an initial assessment of clearance between rolling stock and trackside assets. Its purpose was to identify if any potential issues and to enable more targeted surveys to be undertaken. This task used existing point cloud data and the track rail alignment was from a, three, a current 3D track centerline file. The worst case profile was created for the proposed rolling stock and run, and this is run through the point cloud to identify possible clashes. Assessment following the maximum end and center throws of all locations, 1.2 meters off the main, uh, the main running lane rail. The assessment runs along the crossover route and extends 10 meters along the main line. The images and sections from the assessment were viewed by the track engineer to conf confirm whether further assessment or surveys required. These assessments and images were produced using Trimble GDO scan office software. At each switch, a perspective image has been produced. Any area of point cloud shown red 
falls within the defined profile. Where possible, infringements have been identified and cross sections have been produced. On these cross sections, the size and the intrusion into the profile is noted on the image, and the position on the intrusion is shown on the, the LCS chainage, which is also shown on the image. Let's see if this works. Um, so here's another example where the same point calculator is being used. In this case, it's been used to identify foliage, which is potential lethal risks. A profile was set up to define a virtual zone of influence for class check-in. As you can see, as the profile runs through the scan, data is highlighted and influences that need to be addressed. You can also see it's tied to the LCS chainage, so locations can be clearly identified on site. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for that informative presentation. Uh, just remind again, everyone, that uh, to keep your questions coming in, use via the questions tab, and we'll come on to it at the end. Uh, our next speaker is James Daniel, who will be talking to us about digital tools in highways. James, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Just uh, just trying to work out which buttons to press and which order. So hopefully you can see my screen there in the background. And uh, what I will do is we'll turn off my um, my webcam just because um, I'm hiding in my daughter's bedroom this morning because my wife's doing a conference downstairs. So we're overlapping. So, um, good morning. Thank you um, for the invitation to come and talk today. Um, I appreciate that there's a lot of things going on at the moment. Um, and uh, likewise, this will be some fantastic presentations this morning as well. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm going to have to try and um, up my game a little bit. So um, do please bear with me. So I, James Daniel, Head of Digital for Kia Highways. Um, what does that mean? Well, um, it means that um, I work in a tier one contractor um, and we cover a huge diverse range of products and, and um, construction and, and uh, portfolios across the UK. Um, we have um, presence from Scotland, Northern Ireland, right down to the southeast and southwest of the, of the UK. Um, and specifically today, um, I'm going to talk about some of our activities in our highways business. Um, and as you can see there, we've got roughly about 23 contracts that we look and, that look and deliver, um, look to deliver, I should say. Um, and what's interesting about highways is it's not just um, us sort of maintaining, um, you know, uh, networks um, of, you know, or, or bridges or so on. It's actually strategic projects as well, where we do build um, some pretty um, uh, strategic uh, uh, parts of the highway network across the UK with our major uh, client, which is the Highways England. And as you can see there, you know, we look after about 30,000 kilometres of, um, of local um, and strategic highways. And in terms of some fun facts, there's plenty of fun facts there, which you can have a look at when you get the PDF after the presentation. But, you know, we look after about, you know, 15 out of the 40 tunnels in the UK, which are pretty important. You know, just spaghetti junction alone, you know, 559 concrete columns that we have to look after. And there's a lot of information and, and, and data that sits around that, you know, and then things like, you know, three and a half thousand bridges, you know. Um, very, very important. Might not sound sexy, but there's a lot of information that comes out of these these types of um, assets that you know are, are, are vital to us delivering a decent service or, or a better service to our clients, shall we say, um, than, than than other other businesses. Um, specifically within Kia Highways, we actually have a design operation as well. So we have about 530 people in our highways business that are classified as designers or engineers. Um, overall, within the entire Kia, Kia business, we have about 800 designers and engineers. So we have a huge community of people in our business that operate as a consultancy. Um, and we're the only only tier one that really offers that that service. Um, and by doing that, it allows us to um, to really give a full full um, uh, full full complement of, of services to our clients um, and one of which is is the RDP scheme up in the the north east of the country up in um, oh, northeast northwest my apologies my geography is not very good um, in Blackpool we're doing the, the Windy Harbour scheme which is Windy Harbour to Schiphol um, bypass um, and hopefully we'll get a few slides of that on screen in a moment so what does digital mean to care 
Um, well, firstly, the image on the right there, I was really pleased to see, Mark, this morning on your slides, um, you had people, process and technology. The only difference being is you had information is the, is the, the linkage between all three elements. Um, I've always worked with collaboration. Um, and the reason being is I think when you're a contractor, you're, you're, you're managing a, a huge amount of information and data. And, and unless you can collaborate effectively, the information essentially is worthless um, because it will only go so far before it drops or someone doesn't want to work with it. So for me, um, collaboration is, is really key to you know starting a project well and managing it all the way through the process through to delivery and operations. Um, but I think we're on the same page there. Um, in terms of you know digital, you know people talk about digital and we've talked about it a lot this morning. Uh, it is about moving from analog to, to digital tools, but we don't just mean, you know, let's make a piece of paper, a digital piece of paper and just put the same piece of information inside it and do nothing with it. We've got to evolve from just making stuff a little bit more sexy looking. You know, we've got to have that intuitiveness with, with the systems that we use. We've got to have automated workflows sitting behind the scenes. It doesn't have to be really clever. It could just be simple things like where you were when you filled a form out, what the weather was doing. Can you geotag the photo? So when you do start to look back at your assets and, you know, to have conversations, whether it's in design, whether it's in maintenance or delivery, you know, you know exactly where you're looking and what you're doing. It should simplify how we work. You know, there's, there's been lots of conversations, you know, not just today, but around you know, what workflows we use, what coding we use, what, what naming conventions and layers. And you know, they're all very important. They really are. But it's understanding how we get that from theory into practice. And of course, at the end of this, you know, we've had customers on, on the call today talking about their, their experiences from, from the panel discussion. You know, it is about giving value to our customers. At the end of the day, they want to be able to operate and maintain their assets with confidence. Um, and that's what the digital opportunities can, can give to people. The problem is, though, you know, it's, uh, it's very much the same old conversations and we still get the same old results. You know, um, this has been going on for, you know, 10, 15 years now, longer with some of the papers that have been written. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no more excuses, really, is there, um, with, with the opportunities in front of us around using digital tools and technology. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be hard, but just a small step in the right direction really helps make a big change. Um, I know that there are many, many more white papers and reports and standards and documents that could be on this particular slide, um, but we'd be here for weeks if I put them all up. But I think you get the impression or the understanding of, you know, we have this opportunity now, it's in our grasp. You know, our, our default's been reset in the last 18 months with how we use technology, how we access technology as a day-to-day -day basis. So there's, there's, there's huge opportunities to start pushing forward once we get back into some sense of normality. You know, and data is important. It's important to us, it's important to you. Um, it defines and, and, and helps give you decisions and choices about everything you do from your you know, professional and your personal lives. You know. uh, I think it was, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, but there was a huge comment about, you know, data being structured and unstructured. And it's the same here. You know, we have a huge amount of information that comes in and, and we don't really know what to do with it. And I think that that's a huge challenge that we have to have to address. We're trying to address that in, in, in the highways business, both from um, a construction and design perspective, but also a maintenance perspective as well. Um, and, and as you said, you know, it's not about the amount of data that's important. It is about, you know, the quality of it. You know, what can we do with it? How can we analyze it? How can we make better decisions? You know, it's about, taking that sort of hindsight approach and bringing it forward. You know, and there is there's value of data at every level. Um, you know, just because you drive past a gang on, 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 a, on a highway network and you see them filling a pothole doesn't mean that there's valuable information in what they do. You know, we, we've been looking at uh, business intelligence tools and, and historical information uh, with, with our pothole gangs and, you know, basic sums, you know, if we can, deliver one extra pothole per day with our, our highways gangs you know, at a cost of 75 quid, for example, and we've got eight gangs and 20 contracts. Um, some of the more mathematically adept of you on, on, on this uh, conference call today will, will know that you're looking at a good seven figures worth of improvement potentially. That's a huge amount of money for such a small marginal change, you know, marginal gain in terms of just doing one extra pothole. And why do we do that? Well, we do that because we can offer a better service to our client. We can be more effective with how we go and deliver our service on our networks. 
you know, it can help us, you know, data and, and business intelligence tools can help us, you know, improve the working conditions of our operatives out on the networks. It can be, you know, we can give better results for winter, you know, winter gritting rich, for example. You know, we can get, get the right parts of the country serviced and maintained and safe because we've got information that we can analyze, you know, which historically speaking, we've not been able to do. You know, moving things forward a bit, you know, there's lots of information within, you know, the, the, the subsurface elements of, of our of our networks. And, um, you know, Matthew talking earlier about, you know, the, the bank station where, you know, a lot of subsurface information, a lot of foundations, a lot of really tricky parts to manage. It's no different on a highway network and on, on a, you know, suburban street when you go and do some you know, utilities works. You know, we, we have a lot of information that comes from our utilities um, providers and suppliers. Um, often it comes in, uh, limited formats where you can't intelligently analyze and, and check whether you're going to go and work at an increased level of risk um, and what we're what we're doing within within our highways business our care business actually is um you know we're aggregating all the utility data and, and putting it into geospatial networks where we can go out on site and actually make informed decisions before we start you know breaking tarmac or breaking ground you know having that data makes my workforce safer it makes us more accurate and it helps us reduce costs these are things that you know we should not have as a unique selling point they should be business as usual so um sticking with the theme of data and and let's say design intent um this is this is a screenshot from um a client engagement video that was done for our windy harbor project up in in blackpool um oh, about 18 months ago and this is uh skipper bridge junction um it's quite a quite a complex junction um uh, there's some challenges around it in terms of logistics, in terms of how it interacts with the local community. Um, and there are some unfortunate impacts with um, local houses, residents and, and, and business buildings. Uh, and of course, in the video here that you can see, you can roughly see that the highway does intersect through some of those buildings potentially. And of course, it was great to start talking with members of the public and stakeholders and, and client, of course, to see you know what potentially that 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 could be from a design perspective but of course you know taking information that we then aggregate throughout the life of the project through design through surveys you know we can start to look at you know really what the impacts are uh, and, and we start looking at things like rapid prototyping tools um, to, to rapidly pull together uh, what the impact really is with such a, a big project like this uh, and the community that surrounds it and as you can see unfortunately in the middle of the uh, the, the picture there there is there is a residential building that unfortunately will need to be compulsory purchased now the people that own the house are fully aware they're involved there's been some great discussions but it's really improved stakeholder engagement by having information and data you know, historically speaking, you'd have, you know, people turn up with bits of paper or letters and people wouldn't understand, you know, they wouldn't necessarily understand the value of what's happening with their building, their home, their their, their business and what's happening with, with, with the asset. But by having all this data present to us, we can actually just engage with people really quickly. And, and as an example of what you see on the screen here, it took my team 10 minutes to build this. And it's not me showing off, it's just the fact that we had a lot of information and data available to quickly pull things together to understand the impact of design and construction uh, within this project. And of course, no, no BIM or digital presentation will be um, complete without the obligatory clash detection screenshot. Um, and I think over the last couple of years, a lot of people have become wise and, and um, aware that Hollywood BIM, as it used to be called, is, is, is there's no place for it really. You know, we, we, we just want to get the job done. We want to deal with real information at real times with real people. And the, the image you see, you see on screen here, you know, the, the one in the, on the left hand side, it's a video of a fly through of a clash detected model. Um, and the reason we, we create videos is not everybody in our supply chain or our stakeholder group has access to these types of tools to go and interrogate it themselves. They don't necessarily have the skills or the hardware or some of the client environments won't let them access um, certain tool sets. So, you know, a, a 10, 15 minute fly through video with somebody narrating the challenges and the issues of the current state of affairs with the project actually does more for engagement than anything else. It helps people ask questions about what's happening when and where and why. And of course, on, on the right hand side, you know, quick um, sort of meetings every week with our design teams just helps alleviate the challenges that we're facing. You know, one of the challenges we have with this particular project is is it's being designed and built by four players. You know, Keir, Keir Highways as a construction team, Keir Design Services as a design team, 
Tony G as a, as a design partner and RPS a design partner. And to make, make it even more interesting, we're located in Scotland, England and Ireland. <laughs> so there's a huge level of complexity about how we understand you know, how this design is going to work, how the information is going to flow. And then one of the challenges really is making sure that everything you know, works in the right way and we get people safely onto site. Um, and again, it's it's about being real with the technology and information you have. You know, you don't have to be super flashy with the tools and tech. You know, every every couple of weeks on social media, you see the latest advancement of of um, you know what you can do with your model. But in reality, most people on site, and unfortunately, these three gentlemen were the last people that wanted to have the photograph taken when uh, we wanted to do a, a shot like this. But people just want to see what's happening with the design. They want to engage and understand what's happening uh, from a, a delivery perspective, a safety perspective, which is what you can see there on the screen, the looking safety incursions and issues. Um, this is stuff that, that's just fundamentally important to the way that we operate. But it doesn't happen widespread across the industry. And it's things that need to be championed like this to encourage people to become more adept at using technology and become more adept at understanding that information has a value, no matter who you are or what you do. And of course, by doing that, you really have to set the ground rules, you know, working with client requirements, working with execution plans, understanding that the complexities and the challenges that we've had, particularly in this project is you know, three, four businesses that are located across the country. We've had restrictions because of the last 18 months um, and we're all sort of working on different parts of, of the scheme and the project. But one thing that's really helped us deliver this is the fact that we've known what information is required and when, because the client set the set the ground rules out from the beginning you know we've worked with them to understand why we need volumes in certain materials and certain uh, model codes we've worked out when we need information to flow we've worked out how information is going to be exchanged and it's not just because we want a flashy model it's because we want an asset at the end of the process you know in this particular project all of the asset information and data is being inputted as we go through the process and the reason we're doing it now which is why we're you know which is what's supposed to happen is because nine, nine times out of ten at the end of a project or a scheme you'll have people that are screaming because they can't get information out of the asset because the job's been done it's taken far too long and they've they've run out of money but it should happen as 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 a as as part of the process now, and we can't we can't really do this without the collaborative behaviors of our of our three four businesses and that that's something that we've we've worked hard to do and then um, you know we'll continue to do that as we move forward and of course you know unless you have the ground rules in place you can't go and break ground now this, this is the project scheme right now as it stands up in up in Blackpool. You know we've we've broken ground and and we have enough confidence with the information that we've created that the data that sits inside these models is now being used out with our machine control and we're actually going out and digging up you know uh, hall roads and side roads and site encampments with the data that's being created by you know design supply chain. That's confidence, you know, and of course it comes with collaboration as well. And these are some of the tools that. Um, you know, I think are pretty cool. Um, and it comes from being able to, to take information that we've learned across both maintenance and, and design delivery contracts to understand how, you know, we can protect people by using um, sort of geospatial data for cone laying, using crash barriers that we can mobilize quickly, or even just, you know, using all that weird black things on the right, which is a, called a deck scraper, where you can go and scrape up whole bits of tarmac at them and, and so on to, to go and relay um, highways. That slide in the previous slide that there's ambitions that underlie with all of that within our business and of course it is about you know building that single source of truth and i know we've said it before and we'll say it again we don't have it yet the industry as a whole does not have a single source of truth that it can confidently rely on to start drawing down data examples and information examples but we have to start we have to build that confidence and from that confidence we start to build trust um, and of course once we've got that in place then we can really start to disrupt what we do with information and data and of course, you know, from, from our perspective, that's how we see our care environment, our care digital environment moving forward. And just because some of you might be looking for that photograph of what a digital twin looks like, here's my screenshot. This is um, stolen with pride from Centre of Digital Built Britain. Um, you know, we have an ambition, of course, like many contractors and many designers, that we want to work towards having that, um, you know, trust. And, and sort of truth within what we deliver for our clients existing both in the physical world and the digital world. And to, to end right on a project, we've got to get the basics right, haven't we? We've got to start with those fundamental requirements. And, and from our perspective, this is, this is critical to our success within Kia. Uh, and it starts with you know, creating the right control environment, you know, making sure you know what you're 
you know, know what your client wants, know what you're going to sell to your client or deliver, you know, what are the current capabilities? You know, we, we've talked this morning about um, skills gaps and, and, and challenges around education and people, you know, not wanting to get involved. You know, it's, you have to understand what those, those challenges are. And then you have to work out where you're going to put that data on. In the previous slide, you know, there's a big conversation around, you know, common data environments with the previous presenter and, and it's the same with any project. But it's understanding where that data gets centralized and how it gets accessed and how it gets utilized. Then we have to start closing the gaps between process and people because there are gaps, there's leakages. And that's been discussed many times this morning. And of course, once we started to work through that, it's about continuous improvement, isn't it? It's about automating, innovating and repeating. And that's that's my kind of whistle stop tour of, of digital and Kia highways. I hope that's what you wanted to hear. Um, my apologies if it isn't. If you have any questions, do please um, put them in the chat or um, find me on social media. Thank you. Thank you, James, for uh, for a great case study presentation there. Um, now handing over to our final speaker of the morning, Dr. Jennifer Schooling, who will be talking about smart infrastructure and construction. Jennifer, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. I'll just uh, move to presenter mode. A little bit of luck in the following wind. There we go. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, uh, this is a really great event, I think. Um, it's been really interesting for me to hear from everybody else on the, on the call. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about digital twins and smart infrastructure, um, and crucially about data performance and decision making. And I think in a way, what I'm doing is summing up a lot of what's already been said this morning by um, various colleagues throughout throughout the morning. Um, really, this is all about what data do we want, what data do we need, and how do we best use it to inform our decision making and therefore end up with, with better um, outcomes in, for, from our infrastructure. Um, I'm from the Cambridge Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, and we are um, a, a research centre that works very closely with industry. Uh, with the mission of transforming the future of infrastructure through smarter information and we do that by looking at the whole life cycle of the built asset and I'll come back to the image that's on this slide a little bit later on. <clears throat> um, but I think I'd like to start by just emphasising what has sort of to some extent been coming out of um, this morning already that infrastructure is a system of systems and we have to think of it in that way. Um, it's a very complex system of systems we've heard today from colleagues in water and transport industry but you know it brings in energy buildings and ICT and all of these systems interact with and support each other. Um, the challenge for us is that this system of systems has been built up over 200 years um, and it wasn't designed as a system of systems, it's evolved. But we need to maintain it indefinitely because it's what supports life in our cities, towns and communities. Um, and I think the other thing we need to remember is that each year we only add about 0.5% by value to this complex system with our new infrastructure assets. So even though we have huge projects like Tideway, like HS2 and like some of the big road schemes going on, that's still only adding 0.5% by value to this complex system of systems. The vast majority of our infrastructure is the stuff we already have around us. So when we're thinking about the journey of digitalization and the journey of data, we need to be thinking about how we deploy that on our existing assets as well as our new assets. The other thing is that infrastructure is a system of services. And again, we've sort of been hearing that coming through today, for example, in the water plant panel. It's all actually about the provision of services and using the infrastructure as the tools to do that. Um, and those services are actually what our customers interact with. Um, so obviously, when we start to think about BIM and digital twins, what we're really talking about is infrastructure as a cyber physical system. So we add, for example, sensors to a system or we collect data about how it's being used um, and we create the virtual asset, the digital twin of the physical asset. And what that helps us with, and, and um, this is a slightly different version of, of the diagram that James just showed, is taking data from the physical twin into the digital twin and then proactively making decisions and interventions based on that data onto the physical twin. So what, um, what, what moves you from having a model into having a digital twin is that sort of proactive um, loop, if you like, between the, the virtual and the physical asset. And really it's all about helping us have make better decisions about how we manage and use our assets and how we design and construct them. And this is really what makes smart infrastructure. So smart infrastructure really is simply what you get when you bring the digital and the physical together and you use the digital to help you manage the physical. Um, so we've talked about digital twins already, I'll just skip over that, but obviously we can have digital twins of a single asset 
but we can also have digital twins of a system of assets and we can connect those digital twins together. And you know, some of what we've been talking about today are some of the challenges around actually how do we share data? How, do we, how are we aware of what data is available? How do we track down the data that we need? Um, and then we can have, you know, rather than just having connected transport digital twins, we can connect the transport with the energy with the water. Um, now, obviously, we're not going to, to need all of the detail that we have in about our individual water assets or our individual transport assets to be shared across the systems. We need to think about what data we need to share in order that we can make good decisions about our own assets that we're in control of with a full awareness of the impact of other assets on us and on of our assets on them. So there's a sort of sliding scale, if you like, of the amount of data that you need to share and, and have interoperable between different systems. But what that brings us to is this big ecosystem of digital twins, which is really what we mean when we talk about a national digital twin. So a national digital twin isn't a single monolithic thing. It is a federation of twins which are sharing the, the, the data that they need to share. And someone alluded to this earlier that, you know, it's not about having fully open data necessarily. It's about sharing the data that needs to be shared to facilitate the decisions that we need to make. Um, and in the context of that, the Centre for Digital Work Britain um, created the Gemini principles in consultation with industry and academia. If you haven't seen this document yet, I would really suggest taking a look at it because what it does is really define what a digital twin is, but at quite a high level. So and, and, and what makes for a good digital twin? So a digital twin must have purpose. It must be trustworthy and it must work. So if you have a digital twin that is, you know, a wonderful array of sensors and technology and data, but it's not being used for something, then it's not a digital twin. It's a toy. Um, so really, it must be creating value and providing insight. It must be secure appropriately open and the data must be founded on good quality and again we've heard about that earlier on this morning and we must be able to federate these twins share data where appropriate curate the data i'm going to come on to that in a moment and crucially we must be able to evolve our systems because the pace of change in the digital world is so much faster than the pace of change um in you know in the infrastructure world we build physical assets and we maintain and manage and operate physical assets that might persist for 200 years in the digital world things are changing on a sort of potentially on a yearly basis almost so we really do need to be able to bring those changes into our digital systems and manage and curate those digital systems as much as we manage and curate our physical systems. <clears throat> so coming on to, you know, why bother with all of this? Well, there's a huge opportunity. If we don't measure things, we don't understand them, then we can't improve them. So what we really need to do is learn from the real performance of our existing assets to change the way that we design, deliver, operate and integrate our infrastructure assets through these digital twins using tools like AI and machine learning where appropriate, it's not always necessary, but where appropriate, where we've got vast quantities of data, you know, we can't, we can no longer process that through Excel and MATLAB using spreadsheets and things. We need to um, collaborate with our data science colleagues to help us find what I call the, the um, information needle in the data haystack. But if we do that, then we can reduce uncertainty. Um, you know, we talk about safety factors in design. They're not safety factors, they're uncertainty factors. We use them because we, we, we aren't sure enough of the quality of materials, for example, or the ground conditions and so forth. So the better we understand our assets, our construction sites and so forth, the more we can reduce the uncertainty, the more we can reduce the safety factors to an appropriate level. Obviously, we don't want to go too far. Um, but in doing that, then we can use scarce resources more efficiently and effectively. We can address the challenges of zero carbon and we can really think carefully about resilience and where we need to invest more in terms of materials, carbon, etc., and where we can uh, you know invest less and with all of this then we're creating smart infrastructure solutions for more resilient um cities with the sort of the data underlay helping to underpin our decision making now data can come from a myriad of sources as well i'm sure you all know um you know we have the the obvious stuff about attached and embedded sensing systems we've heard a little bit about some of that today some of the sensing systems might be on vehicle whether that's on a construction site vehicle or on a, a train running on a live track um, I know that, for example, Crossrail has um, not just a monitoring train, but it also has monitoring on some of the passenger trains. Um, we can go from attached and embedded sensors that are you know, intimately linked to our assets all the way up to remote sensing using satellites at the most extreme version or um, drone based surveys and so forth. But we also shouldn't forget that there are material flows and process data, for example. So understanding where materials are on a construction site, that's a crucial piece of information. Understanding how many people are using a particular transport artery or how much water is used at a particular time of day is also crucial information about our infrastructure. 
And the other kind of, uh, of data we can use is data we don't generate, um, like social media data um, or Wi-Fi check-ins. Um, I know, for example, that TfL has used um, Wi-Fi check-ins on the system to understand how people are moving around during disruptions and that kind of thing, to understand what alternative routes people naturally take. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities to gather and use data to benefit what we do, to improve our decision-making processes. However, that can be a confusing old world. And again, we've heard some of this this morning that, you know, it's not about just having lots of data. It's about the quality of data. It's about the purpose of use. And we really need to think about what is it we're trying to achieve? Therefore, what data do we need? And therefore, how do we create that data? How do we need to manage it so that it is accessible, as was being said as part of the water panel today, you know, that people know it exists, that they can get to it, that they can then use it to inform the decisions they need to make. And if we do all of that, then we can you know, use tools to make sense of the data and really inform our decisions. I think the challenge is that in our industry, quite often, we're really good actually at generating quantities of data. The problem is we look at it once, if that, check whether it's gone past a particular threshold or not often. If it hasn't, we all go, phew, that's great. And if it has, then everyone panics. <laughs> but actually, if we manage and curate our data better and look at trends in the data over the long term, for example, then we can move from the sort of find and fix approach that we often have to a predict and prevent approach to managing our infrastructure, to operating our infrastructure, and also to making sure that, for example, our construction is at the quality it needs to be. So I think if you take nothing else away from what I say today, please take away the message that data curation is crucial. We need to think about what we need to know, when we need to know it, and how we get that data in order that we don't start to drown in a data lake or find ourselves unable to make critical decisions based on good information. So if we have this better data, what can we do with it? Um, now, as I said before, we have this complex system of systems um, and we need to take a whole life approach. So when we're thinking about an asset, we need to think about how long will this asset be used for um, in the current focus, of, uh, urgent focus of reducing and, and getting reducing carbon and getting to net zero. Will creating more embodied carbon now save carbon over the life cycle or not? You know, if we over predict the life cycle of something, if we say this is going to operate for 100 years, but actually we know it's going to, parts of it are going to be replaced in 20, then that's not a good investment of materials and carbon. How can we make these assets more energy efficient? How can we make them easier to maintain? All of this is part of taking a whole life perspective and it applies from the first moment of design through to construction, through to the actual operation and management of the assets. If we do that then, there are a number of opportunities. So in design, for example, we can take data from our real constructed assets and use them to calibrate and validate our models, reducing uncertainty. Um, that will help us design for whole life value. So to design for the lifetime that we need, invest materials where we need them and avoid wasting them. Um, and this will bring us both to better resilience combined with lower resource use. At the moment, I think often resilience comes at the cost of resource use. Um, in construction, we can manage materials better. We can use um, videogrammetry and photographs and, and, and that kind of thing to help us with construction progress. And we can use um, visual imagery as well to help with quality monitoring. So all of these things help with reducing waste. They help improve quality. They help improve delivery and they reduce schedule risk. The more we can understand what's going on on our sites, the more confident we are of, of when, you know, when the next stage of the process will be completed, when to bring the next team onto site. And then in terms of operation and management, condition monitoring and prediction is, is crucial to managing our assets well. Um, most importantly, to avoiding disruption through asset closure or worse still, asset failure, um, but also to getting best value out of our maintenance activities. You know, we, we always have a constrained maintenance and asset management budget. There's never enough money to keep everything in tip top condition all the time. So we need to really understand which of our assets are most crucial to our operation and which interventions are going to bring us best value in terms of continuing to be able to deliver the service that the asset delivers. So for example, if you're a railway, you know, the service that you're delivering is not keeping bridges looking beautiful or keeping track in a shiny condition. The service you're delivering is enabling people and goods to move around the country when they need to arrive on time and so forth. And then it's the role of the asset in delivering that service that's the, the most important thing. Um, and we can also think about the future proofing needs for our assets. So in the context of climate change, how will the condition of our assets um, evolve and, and how resilient are they going to be to future changes in climate? So that really gives us then the opportunity to have a whole life value-based approach to asset management. 
Um, and then finally, we need to think about infrastructure in the context of our cities and communities. You know, how much demand do we have now? How much demand will we have in the future? How do we optimise network use and management? Be that how do we use the ground as an energy source or how do we keep traffic flowing efficiently through a city to avoid pollution and waste of, waste of energy? Um, and how can we use city scale digital twins to help with that? Um, and when we come to city scale dig digital twins, the area around sort of governance and engagement and trustworthiness becomes all the more important because at that stage, you're really involving citizens and data about citizens in, in the, the digital twin process. But there's also a huge opportunity. And again, someone um, alluded to this earlier, that you, know, you can use good data to demonstrate to people how a change will affect them, how that, you know, what the positive effects and the negative impacts will be, and have a conversation about how that will play out. So there's a real opportunity there to use data, not just to meet infrastructure needs, but to deliver social value in collaboration with the community. So just a few quick examples that, that we've done in CSIC. This first one is um, in a crossrail tunnel where we, were, we monitored the, um, the tunnel lining as the cross passages were pushed through into the running tunnel from the passenger tunnels. And um, crucially with this, what we were looking at is how much spray concrete lining thickening do you need at this part of the tunnel structure? Because the, 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 the lining is thickened because obviously increased stresses will occur as the tunnel is driven through. Um, but spray concrete lining is carbon intensive, it's costly, it's logistically challenging, and it, it's not the safest of um, activities. So you know, the more we can reduce it, the better. And what we found with this was that the finite element models, because they're because up till now we haven't been able to really monitor the, the strains and stresses within um, a structure as, as we're doing this kind of activity, the models are based on a variety of assumptions and they're, they're the best assumptions we can make based on the information we have, but they're not calibrated. So when we compared the data that we captured with the actual um, the, the finite element model, what we found was that the model was very conservative. And not only did the strains in the material not get anywhere close to what we predicted, but also the, the, the impact of the, the tunnel was over a much smaller area than had been anticipated. So the inference one can take from this is that if we do a few more of these, because you're never going to change the codes based on one example, but if we do some more of this work, then we can start to say, well, okay, you can reduce both the length of um, spray concrete lining thickening and also um, potentially the thickness of it. And that gives you cost improvements, schedule improvements, carbon improvements and safety improvements. So there's a huge amount we can get from this kind of an example. Um, we did some other work looking at how tall buildings behave as you're constructing them and the extent to which um, our existing modelling capability to understand the compression in the lower floors as the upper floors go up is adequate, the extent to which um, you know, weather, daily insulation, that kind of thing affects it. Then in construction, we can monitor third party assets and this example here is from the um, bank station capacity upgrade. So this is St Mary Abchurch, which sits um, very close to a large excavation and was having a tunnel driven underneath it, 400 year old church built by Sir Christopher Wren. You really don't want to be responsible for damaging it. Um, the traditional approach to an asset like this is to undertake sort of remedial works before you do the tunnel drive, for example, um, in order to protect the asset. The problem is this is a 400 year old structure. It's had bombs dropped next to it. Other things have been built next to it over time. Um, and the best thing to do to an elderly structure like this is as little as possible. So in fact, what we use as a mitigation measure rather than active measures was to monitor the church as all of this construction was taking place and to look for um, strains that might be of concern that might end up causing damage. That meant that, um, you know, we could, if need be, the construction processes could be adjusted um, and remedial action could be taken if needed. As it turned out, no remedial action was required and it's anticipated that the, the team saved um, over a million pounds by investing you know, a few tens of thousand pounds in monitoring with us. Um, we also have um, the opportunity to do a similar activity for operation and maintenance. So this is an example of a, a network rail bridge which had some concerning looking cracking on it. Um, the asset managers had very little in the way of records because it's a 200 year old bridge um, and the, the cracks had evolved in such a way that we didn't really understand how the bridge was performing. So the first thing we did was deploy sensing on it to understand how it was performing and then to install further sensing to do long term monitoring 
of the cracked areas that were a concern where we, we realized that actually there was potential for those cracks to be growing. So now what we have is an asset which can tell us how well it's feeling um, and then that enabled us to allay concerns over the speed of trains going over the bridge, for example, and it will inform future maintenance decisions. Um, we can also, as I said before, look at things like how we prioritise the, the, both the monitoring interventions and then the um, maintenance interventions on bridges using um, tools to help us quantify what before we've only been able to do with engineering judgment. So to look at actually which assets are most critical on a network which assets are going to cause most problems if they have to be decommissioned, taken out of service for a while. And this sort of value-based assessment is really crucial, as I said before, for appropriately deploying limited funds. And then finally, in the context of cities, we can look at future-proofing by understanding actually how future-proofed our current designs are or our current assets are, how future-proof they need to be against any future problems and where the gaps are. Because again, that can help us prioritise either active interventions or saying we can't afford to make that intervention and understanding what risk we're building up for the future. Um, we can also use this to address carbon. I'm not going to dwell on these because I'm running out of time, but um, the slide might be available later to, to share. Um, but as a result of that, and thinking about all the questions I've just been talking about, um, we've been working with the um, Construction Leadership Council to develop a carbon reduction code. Um, this code is going to be soft launch um, in the UK um, on the 17th of June. Um, if, you, if you type in the, the bit.ly code there, then um, you'll be able to find more information about it, or you can go to the CSIC website um, to find out more. Um, and then it will have a, a further sort of formal launch at the um, COP26 in Glasgow in November. The aim of this is to actually demonstrate that we are reducing carbon in construction. Um, because it's vital that we do as much as we can as soon as we can to reduce the carbon that we're emitting because every tonne of carbon we emit today uh, remains up there in the atmosphere warming the planet for the next century or two. Um, so in conclusion then, I think it's important to note that smart infrastructure delivers value. I think this is my last slide. Yeah, smart infrastructure needs to be deployed to provide data for decision making through the design, construction and whole life operation of an asset. Um, this whole life view is really critical for resilience, resource efficiency and, and reducing carbon. New assets have to be seen as part of this wider system of systems, and, but we also need to make sure that we're deploying these cyber physical solutions onto our existing assets because they are the, 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 the dominant component of what we have around us. Um, data curation and digital data collection are vital. Um, too often we have sensors that are creating data that isn't actually being automatically transmitted or information is being transmitted on paper. If information is transmitted on paper, it's incredibly difficult to find and chances are it will never get seen. And then finally, um, smart infrastructure solutions add value to our existing assets. So there's a repeat there of, of um, lines, I'm not quite sure why. Um, so I hope that's been interesting and informative um, and thank you for your attention and I will now hand back to Craig. Thank you, Jennifer, for a really informative presentation. I'd like to welcome back all of our speakers and, and panellists now and hand over to Mike Turpin from the Communities Leadership Team to run the question and answer session. So, Mike, over to you. Thanks, Craig. Great. So, yes, if I can get all the panellists to uh, jump back on our screen here. Um, kick off with the Q&A session. So some great questions coming in off the back of some very good uh, presentations now. So I'm going to start in a kind of logical order of where we start with the presentation. So my first question is directed over to Mark. So this question has come from John Nielsen. And uh, the question is, how is the ICE linking with the far wider construction industry in the work they're doing? So obviously planners, architects, surveyors, etc., all have a part to play. Um, what work is the ICE doing at crossing that border? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mean, to start with the, uh, the the push by the IC is really well aligned with uh, other institutions and you know other bits around the the industry. And then there are some specific partnerships. So, for example, with the CIOB um, uh, in this uh, data and digital space. So, so I I think we're starting to see some quite useful kind of connections being made. 
Um, but as I'm sure you're aware, the, the ICE is, uh, is super well connected through the industry anyway. Uh, and one of the things I, I mentioned was uh, how the ICE puts together support for um, for influencing policy, uh, and you know that there are some direct connections in there which are, are, are very helpful uh, for joining things up. So, so I get the sense that that this is maybe being well beginning to be quite nicely joined up but that's definitely what it has to be it has to it has to be a joined up thing you, you know you, you can't do digital transformation in a uh, in a silo absolutely great thanks for that mark um so next over i'm going to move over to peter um so peter I've got a question for you from anthony brophy um that is is the i3p community open to technology providers to join yeah, absolutely um it recently relaunched actually to make it far more open uh, it, historically it was very close to the what we would call the, the original clients but when they relaunched a couple of months ago to make it more open uh, definitely technology tier ones tier twos and the wider supply chain can all go and register to join uh, i3p and, and start accessing the sort of knowledge that's being uh, stored there around innovation Great, thanks, Peter. Yeah, I guess with, with all these initiatives and uh, kind of the community spirit that comes through with the UK BIM Alliance, the more people we get involved and the, the kind of more voices we get, the uh, uh, we're going to push forward these initiatives. Um, so next up, I've got a question for the BIM for Water panel. Um, so Claire, I'm going to direct this um, towards you, um, but feel mm -hmm. free if you want to pass that on to someone else. Um, so the first question we've got for that is what makes the challenge of information management in infrastructure unique and uh, what's one piece of advice we could take away to implement on projects to assist with that oh that was good for fiona if she's on the call still holding sorry i am here i'm just having problems hearing sorry can you just repeat that no problem i will repeat that possibly so questions what makes the challenge of information management in infrastructure a unique one? Um, and what's one piece of advice you can give to take away that uh, people can use to implement this on projects? Um, I mean, for us, uh, the inf information is where um, it has, it's been really hard for us to find information, especially around construction and how um, sort of at one have um, commissioned that, um, with the, with the drawings with p and ids so we're trying at the moment to um this is where office 365 and sharepoint comes into it because we're trying to now bring a library together which is um split in between sites which allows people to start storing uh, a library of information about that site which will cover everything and then this will allow people to be able to share that information will have version control in place. So people will know there's one place, one library for them to be able to um, pull data through. And we can make this available to operations, to anybody within uh, Anglia Water. Fantastic, thanks for that. Uh, I guess we clear for one more question on there, if I may, um, which is a question we've got from uh, Simon Impey, which is have there been any initiatives to standardize the data taxonomy between the water companies, uh, e.g. ISO 15926? I don't know that standard person myself, but potentially some of your uh, team do, but I guess the main question is, have there been any initiatives between the water companies uh, to standardize those data taxonomies? Um, I'm trying to think you could take that one. Dermaid, is there anything you could offer? Um, probably not. Um, uh, there's only in Ireland. It's just ourselves, so it's probably more relevant to the UK environment. Sharing amongst utilities there, maybe, but uh, not involved in it either. Um, sorry. Yeah, I think a lot of the water companies are looking at <coughs> standard data, uh, standard data templates of information. And I think we're recognising, I know from an MWH point of view, working on the different regions, that there is that requirement for a, a standardised work, break, work breakdown structure. 
to help with all the different data management so from our programs to our CAD model um, so there's a definite need for it um, and I think we are having those conversations to get things aligned um, and stop people working in silos and it's not just the case of it's best for, for just us it's actually better for the whole um, the whole of the sector so there are steps the right conversations are happening it's just quite a slow process I think to to make sure everyone gets heard and their bit of information gets included. Can I, can I, I was, yeah, I was, can I just, because mm -hmm. the BIM for Water have a number of sub working groups, including mm -hmm. the clients and looking at data and standardization, which is actually bringing together the, the client level as well as a supply chain. So there is activities that are happening uh, across the water industry uh, to, to try and achieve that. And there's also, I think Mark was going to talk about the water data task group as well that's been set up, <laughs> uh, aligned to the sort of the digital transformation to look at how we can actually standardize at that level nationally the whole data approach to linking with what InfoWater are doing with the national digital twin. Yes, that's right. That's people, right. People, totally stole my thumb. There's, Sorry, there's very, uh, Mark. <laughs> very, very little. No, it's good. It's, it was really good. Um, very little to add, um, but but maybe to say that there's there's something similar happening in other sectors too. So so originally there was the energy data task force that did some brilliant work, uh, and you, you you may well have seen some of the output of that. Um, the water data task force got got started up, uh, as Peter said, from the um, BIM for Water. Uh, there's also a telecoms data task force. So so clearly the the idea here is that uh, each sector kind of does its thinking around this space, but also that the sectors join together um, with the with the common standards uh, and so the, the kind of the moving towards the information management framework uh, is 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 the subtext here which would be so good for all of us it really would fantastic great collaborative uh, community answer there so Simon hopefully that one uh, answers your question on that side okay so thanks to the water group uh, next I'm going to move over to Matthew uh, Matthew got a question about your bell which is from Mercedes Santos, which is where can I find more information about the CO2 model of the stations that TFL are doing? Um, is there any additional info out there? Um, not sure if there's any on public, but I'm um, sort of con contact me offline, and we can have a discussion with the uh, relevant people within TFL who've been leading that work stream. I guess that links a little bit as well. Into the, uh, Stuff that Jennifer is presenting on CO2 at the end there as well. Uh, kind of more stuff for you there, Mercedes. So uh, next, I'm going to move over to James Daniel. Uh, so James, question from your presentation: um, Have you experienced any challenges so far in delivering the Highways England's asset data requirements? Um. <clears throat> Well, the short answer is yes. You, you're going to have challenges because the requirements are are very detailed from the client side. Let's, let's not um, ignore that. I think they've done a fantastic job uh, by detailing and outlining what their their asset specifications are. I think that the challenges really are from a a personal and a resource perspective. You know, th th there's a huge body of um, work placed upon our information managers and our, our coordinators and our, our people across projects and project delivery, um, and it's just it's just keeping on top of it through the life of the project. I think, you know, I sort of made a reference to that, you know, panicking at the end of a project, which would be a building or a highway type of work. You know, at the end, everything's finished, everyone's packed up, everyone's gone, you know, and we, we've lost the value and the benefit of what, what we can get from that asset and what the client's paying for ultimately. Um, so the challenges are that, you know, we do we do have them, but they're not negative challenges. They're, they're challenges where we're just trying to stay on top of it. Um, one of my team actually today is spending every, every every week, he'll spend a day going through the previous week's activities and, and uploads and processes and agreements and discussions to make sure that all of the assets in, in the environment, in the model environment, in the information environment, are correctly located and uploaded and approved. Um, and we have to do this through just discipline. Otherwise, you know, you, you do, the, the challenges that you're alluding to will become very big and very negative and very hard. And all of a sudden, all, all of the value that, you know, that Jennifer was talking about in terms of smart infrastructure just drops off the face of the earth. There's, there's, there'll be no, no value in it going forward. So 
it's not that there's a challenge from a client by any means. I think they're they're pretty clear on what they want and they're they're very engaging with us as as suppliers and supply chain partners uh, about their objectives. And I think that dialogue's great and it should be celebrated. Um, it's just making sure that we when we do deliver a project or when a project is delivered, you 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 account for it and you make it part of your process. Thanks, James. Yeah, great, great comments there. Um, so last but not least, I'm going to move over to Jennifer and a question around your presentation. So some um, some great initiatives there and lots of uh, good work to see that the centre are doing. The um, question is, is what can I guess, kind of the teams on the ground and the kind of practitioners delivering projects do to kind of really get involved in this now and I guess kind of set the foundations for uh, some of this future work that's coming in? As a, what can people do as a kind of initiative to get involved in that? I think the key thing is to be open to change. And as James said, it, it's about discipline. So data isn't really any different to anything else we do, um, including getting up and brushing our teeth in the morning. You know, it's kind of a bit of a fag. It takes a few minutes, but who wouldn't do it? Because, you know, we don't want our teeth to fall out. We, we don't want to be wasting materials. We don't want our assets to be in a poor condition. We want our infrastructure to still be delivering good services. So, you know, discipline is another word for good habits, really. We need to get into good habits. We need to think about what data we need in order to manage things well and to move away from doing things the way we always did it because that's the way we've always done it. You know, as an example, I've been looking on a project recently um, with collaborators on construction sites about you know how how much waste do we have in terms of just concrete. We're only looking at concrete in this one on our sites. It's been incredibly difficult to get the data that we need from even one site because. The data comes in on paper chips, um, it gets hung on a hook in the manager's office. If someone is really motivated, they might put that data into an Excel spreadsheet on a computer somewhere. It's really not beyond the wit of humanity to think up something like, even if you have to move things with paper chips, having a QR code on that piece of paper that creates an electronic um, record for what got delivered and the time it got delivered at. You know, these things are not difficult to do. We just need to be motivated to do it. So thinking about how we improve our processes, and we can all do this in our day-to-day -day work, um, and those of us who are in a position of influence um, in our companies or, you know, who have managerial responsibility can create the atmosphere for others to do it. Um, and I think, um, was it Matt who was presenting about the, the Kia work and, you know, showing some guys pouring tarmac on the road? Well, everybody has a role to play in data collection. And if we explain to them what their role is and how that's important to delivery of the service then they'll do it you know but people don't deliberately go out for example to build an unsafe thing you get taught how to do a job safely you get taught how to put in a component safely and you do it because that's the way you do it if you understand how data is contributing to a project you will do it so i think we just all need to grab hold of the data opportunity and say this is something we can all do together um, and look for the opportunities to do the small stuff, because as Peter was saying, the small stuff builds up to big stuff, and look for the opportunities to do the transformative things as well, because we have to innovate urgently if we're going to tackle things like the climate crisis in a time frame that means that we avoid you know, all of the negative impacts that we know comes with a four degree rise in temperature. Fantastic answer. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Okay, hey, so we've got a couple of last minutes, so I'm going to go for one last quick question that we've had to kind of come in, and I'm going to aim this to start over towards Mark, um, and then we might have time for perhaps a couple of additions to it as well um, from any of our other panellists. Um, and this has been that there's kind of a great theme obviously going through um, all of the presentations today really about the kind of power of data um, and what you can do with having uh, a good selection of high quality data available to you. Um, the question is then, what are your thoughts on how this high quality data can be secured? I guess there's a component of kind of a QA on that data as well, and we can all collect data, but how can we make sure we can rely on it, make sure it is high quality rather than uh, just a pile of data we can't do anything with? so many important things in that in that question um, you know di different layers of it i mean starting on on the security thing i, I think it, it really is important for us to to, to recognize that security mindedness has, has to be the absolute foundations of what we do here yeah we, we've got got to build in security mindedness from the foundation up 
So, so, so that's kind of like number one point. Let's work out what security mindedness is and do it. Um, I, th I think that, um, that there are other layers to that though. Uh, and, and so for example, talking about the quality of data, uh, I think it's really important to recognize that, that quality only really has meaning uh, in relation to the purpose to which it's put. Uh, and so quality, uh, data which might be of a sufficient quality for, for one purpose might not for another. Uh, so, so quality isn't an absolute thing, like this is high quality, that's low quality. It depends on, on the purpose to which it's put. Uh, and so we, we need to start to understand what those purposes are and start to be able to define uh, the quality of data in relation to that much better. But I think something that, that really helps in that uh, is starting to get a bit more rigorous. This is going to, to what Jennifer was saying about brushing our teeth. Uh, you've got to get a bit more rigorous um, about having high quality data models. Uh, and, and if we have um, a consistent approach to data modeling, then that, that starts to reduce the friction in data sharing. Uh, not only that, we can start to have shared reference data that reduces the friction in data sharing. Uh, and, and so it's not just about the quality of, of kind of one particular data set, but it's also how those data sets then relate to each other. So it's the quality of our data models as well as the quality of our, our data. So, so like I said, the question has got so many rich seams that we could explore, and I don't suppose you want me to explore them all just now, but, but that would be the, the, the stuff off the top of my head. If only we had a, another half hour to go into that uh, particular topic, but uh, thanks, Mark. It's a, a great response to that. So where that uh, time is ticking on um, and it's coming up to lunchtime, I'm sure you could all do with your breaks. So in that, I'm going to thank all of you, all of the panel for all your presentations today and joining me in the Q&A session at the end. And I'll pass back to Craig for our final wrap up. Thank you, Craig. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, I, it's been a it's been an absolute pleasure doing this doing this today, and, and I think what we've seen all morning is all the great work that's going on on in the infrastructure area of the industry in regards to digital and how collaboratively we we're trying to actually get break the silos down and getting this working to the benefit of all. And it, it's really positive seeing all of all of the different presentations uh, and interactions between the speakers today. It's been fantastic. So just to let everyone know that our next communities conference will be based on manufacturing. Uh, that will be on the 6th of October as part of the Digital Construction Hub, as part of UK uh, Construction Week. Um, again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers today. Um, again, great content from, from all of them. A big thank you to Pam in the background, as always, ensuring everything runs smoothly. Um, thank you to all of you for attending. And just a reminder to please visit the events page on the UK BIM Alliance website um, to keep up to date with all the various events that we're running. So thank you to everyone. Stay safe and hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Craig and Pam.